Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, February 27th. We're here for a council session, and we are going to begin with the proclamation recognizing International Mother Language Day by Councilmember Fana Gonzalez. That happens when you're a former elected official and you're used to sitting over there coming to <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Natalie Fanny Gonzalez. I'm the Brown Council member in District 6. And today is an awesome day because we're celebrating um, Mother Language Day. It's a, it's a day declared by the United Nations to recognize foreign languages. Now, you may think, and that was yesterday, but since we're sister today, we're celebrating today. You may think, Natalie, why is this so important? Well, as you may know, I'm the only immigrant on the county council, and English is now my first language. You can hear my beautiful accent. And uh, I'm very proud of my heritage, and I'm also proud of the people who work in the state of Maryland to ensure more kids uh, understand the importance of learning a foreign language. And with me today, I have three amazing amazing powerful women who I have met many years ago two of them I met when I was in high school and another one I met when we were in college um, I'm gonna start with uh, Mrs. Flores Mrs. Flores was my teacher in high school when I came to the States I came in 10th grade I didn't speak English and uh, where's Mr. Flores somewhere oh, I see him oh with the guy with the camera all right so when I came to the States as an ESO student um, I was placed in a math class, and as soon as I jumped, I get into a math class, Mr. Flores was my math teacher, and he noticed that my math was very, very good. Um, and that very same day, he went to the principal's office and told them, this kid, although she does not speak English, her math is very advanced, she should not be in that class. So he fought for me, and ended up in AP Calculus. Imagine that. Um, because you don't need to understand the language when you know numbers, right? Um, when I took the SAT, my math score was almost perfect. My English was not very good looking, but I, I ended up okay, I think. Um, so that day, when he changed, helped me change classes, he told me, you gotta take classes with my wife, who also works in, the, in this same high school. She's a Spanish teacher, and I said, but I speak Spanish, I'm here to learn English. And he said, at some point, you gotta, you gotta take her AP Spanish class, because you're learning literature there, which is a totally different thing. So finally, when I got to my senior year of high school, I went to her class and completely changed my life uh, because it's not just speaking the language, it's understanding how to write the language and loving the language. So that was my connection with um, Mrs. Flores, who's after, what, 40 years in academia, she's about to retire, and uh, she has dedicated herself to the entire state of Maryland, leading a department on, long, on world languages, and uh, pushing the state of Maryland to do amazing things with different languages in the county. I'm gonna give her uh, her time so she can speak. Then the second person that I wanna introduce is her former delegate, Ana Sol Gutierrez. I met Ana when I was in high school too, being an activist uh, many years ago, and her passion for foreign languages, um, it's amazing, and, and, the, and her passion to ensure that kids, especially people like me who were not born here, could succeed. Uh, we owe her so much, and I'm, I'm very glad that she came here today, and she, she'll speak about her contributions in the state. And then the, la the last person that I want to introduce is my dear friend Tamara Hewlett, who Tamara I met when I, I was in college, okay? So we, want, we both went to Goucher College, and she now, now works for NCPS, one of the leaders in MCPS, and I'm going to let her talk about uh, her contributions within the MCPS community. With that, before I read the proclamation, I'm going to ask Mrs. Flores to please uh, share a few words. Thank you, Natalie. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation to this event and for giving me the opportunity to talk about languages and to share my passion for language with you. As a K-12 World and Classical Language Supervisor in Prince George's County Public School, when we talk about languages that have the implication for identity, 
communication that is not important, that is so important in the 21st century. We talked too about custom, traditions, value, social integrations, education, and development. These components go hand in hand with your culture. It is very important that we celebrate the International Mother Language Day, which is observed every year and serve as a reminder to promote linguistic, cultural diversity, address global problems, and to celebrate and reinforce the achievement of humanity. As supervisor in Prince George's County, we offer 12 languages. A student can choose the language that they feel will help them to become an asset to society and or community. We develop and manage the Spanish and French native speakers' tongues and for some of our students. They can feel the power of their own language and be proud of their intangible heritage. We need to promote a global conversation, take steps, and create tools for the preservation, revitalization, and the promotion of all languages around the world. Two years ago, we introduced a new course to Prince George's County Public Schools and the State of Maryland. The name, Foundation of Interpretation and Translation. It's important to take into consideration that translation is a necessary tool and a big component of languages. When I started at PGCPS in 1984, I encountered students with poor knowledge of the native language. It was then that I develop advanced languages classes and two time to elevate the importance of the native language. Council member Ms. Natalie Fanny Gonzalez sat in my class and witnessed how her peers fell in love with their languages and learned to be proud of their heritage. There is no better satisfaction for educators than to see that their students are successful in life and to see them become a powerful tool for the global society. It is important to empower and be connected, outdated models of understanding. And to finish, I would like you to answer and reflect on this. How can you bring a more critical lens to the dissemination of the importance of language in order to improve our practices and leave to the side any bias about languages and culture? We can create a better world. Are you ready for the language journey? Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we're going to have Ms. Tamara Hewlett, Director of the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education for MCPS. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very honored to be here today. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman Natalie Fanny. Um, when I think about what language means, language is a tool for communication. Language is inextricably tied to culture. So it's very important that when we meet people who speak different languages, we honor what they come with. So as the director of the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education in Montgomery County Public Schools, that is our mission, to honor the languages that our students enter our doors through, build upon those languages, and not be subtractive. It's important that students and, and people in general um, understand that they are whole, whatever language they speak. When you add another language, you're cognitively becoming even better at what it is that you're doing and how to communicate. And so we honor everyone who speaks languages, multiple languages. I don't want to center English, so that's why I'm trying not to mention it. Um, but the students that I serve are adding English to their linguistic repertoire. And it's important that we don't uh, uh, shun the languages they come with. We only build upon those languages, strengthen those languages, and add English to their linguistic repertoire. Language connects our students for generations. If we continue to build on the languages of the mother tongue, generations, grandchildren, can communicate with their grandparents. Students can communicate and grow and become global citizens. So it's very important that we honor the mother language and um, I'm so glad that this day exists. So thank you. And last but definitely not least, the powerhouse, former delegate Ana Solutiaros. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. 
I want to congratulate you, Nata, and the council for voting in this uh, this wonderful proclamation. Um, it's the first time I've been here in person. Uh, my first question as an engineer was, how did they fit so many seats in the same space? <laughs> but I watch you uh, Zoom. Uh, I, I am here to give my support for this uh, proclamation. And it's it's been something that I was born with. But mother tongue, why is mother included in that? Because your mother, your mother teaches the child how to speak and that mother tongue is so very important though I sometimes think I had two mother tongues <laughs> because I speak uh, both Spanish and English uh, and I feel comfortable in both languages I, I only wake up in the middle of the night when I'm sleeping and dreaming about somebody who doesn't speak the language I'm sleeping <laughs> I'm, I'm dreaming and I, I wake up and I sleep and I change languages and that's fine <laughs> but uh, 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 other than the importance of supporting this uh, proclamation and really supporting uh, the concept that my uh, colleagues have expressed of embracing those who are not like you and uh, welcome the many. And so we have many here in Montgomery County whose native language is not English, and yet they've come here and they work here and they want the same thing that we all want for our children, for our family. And language is so important to be able to do that. And so this is a wonderful uh, proclamation that hopefully will make Montgomery County a standout in supporting those that are different from us, speak different from us. Uh, one of the, the most proud moments uh, was when the bill uh, that I introduced it took three years to get it passed, uh, was a seal of biliteracy. It wasn't original. It, I stole it from California, of course. Uh, but it recognized that in schools, those students that made the effort to learn a, uh, another language, and not just learn it, you know, cuss words or whatever it is, but to learn the literature and to learn how to write it and to be proficient in the language, were recognized by the school as having achieved something, uh, as an achievement that would help them in college, go to college, get accepted at college, and in their work. And so the seal of biliteracy now is Maryland law. And so many students uh, are now graduating with a seal of biliteracy. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I couldn't be happier the, this moment and this, uh, this uh, opportunity to say thank you. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Council. Thank you so much to the Honorable Ana Sol Gutierrez for introducing the bill a few years ago, which is now law. So I'm going to read the proclamation right now, and it says, the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland proclamation, whereas, bear with me, language is a means of communication and a reflection of culture, identity, heritage, and opportunity. The 2024 theme for International Mother Language Day is multilingual education, a pillar of learning, and intergenerational learning, which highlights the importance of promoting, preserving, and celebrating the diversity and richness of languages spoken worldwide, and whereas preserving and mastering the mother language from a young age benefits students in multilingual environments as their language expertise can open more doors later in life. Languages are an economic driver, and research shows that countries that actively nurture multilingualism see many benefits, including a more, more diverse and innovative workforce. And whereas it has also been shown that bilingual and bilater bilaterate individuals have an easier time understanding math, that's right, concepts and solving complex problems. That is why fostering language learning helps our economy in the long term. And we must recognize programs like the Maryland Seal of Bilateracy for incentivizing students to develop in advanced understanding of languages early in their lives. And whereas we must also recognize dedicated educators teaching foreign languages in the school system, not on only Montgomery County, but throughout the state. We're fortunate to have dedicated educators like Mrs. Maria Flores, who embodies the spirit of International Mother Language Day. 
Her passion for language and culture shines through in her teaching, inspiring her students to explore new ways of expressing themselves and connecting with others in an ever-increasing complex world. Mrs. Flores' commitment to promoting multilingualism and cultural understanding has impacted the entire state of Maryland by enriching the lives of thousands of students. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby commemorates International Mother Language Day 2024, and be further resolved that Montgomery County appreciates the diverse languages and cultures we present and embrace multilingualism as an economic development driver. Presented on this day, um, 2024 by Natalie Fanny Gonzalez and Council President Andrew Fritzen. Thank you. Okay, well thank you so much to Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. We'll now move on to our agenda for general business. Madam Clerk, do you have any announcements? Yes, sir, thank you, Mr. President. The Montgomery County Council is seeking applicants to fill one full-term vacancy on the Montgomery County Planning Board. Applicants must live in Montgomery County and be registered to vote in the county as a member of any political party or unaffiliated with any <coughs> political party. Applications must be received no later than 5 o'clock p.m. on Monday, March 11th, 2024. Also, agenda item 9L, action on supplemental appropriation 2448, has been deleted from the agenda. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. The minutes from the February 6th, 2024 council meeting have been circulated to colleagues. Are there any object objections to approving these minutes? Seeing none, these minutes stand approved. Thank you to everybody who's here for this afternoon's public hearings. Uh, the first public hearing is a public hearing on Zoning Text Amendment 2401, Household Living, Civic and Institutional Uses. This ZTA would allow multi-unit living and townhouse living on properties with a religious assembly or private educational institution use in certain zones, provide development standards for multi-unit living and townhouse living on properties with a religious assembly or private educational institutional use, and generally amend the provisions for household living when combined with certain civic and institutional or other uses. A planning, housing, and parks committee work session is scheduled for March 11, 2024. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business on March 4, 2024. We have a number of speakers uh, for ZTA 2401, the Faith ZTA. Uh, I'm going to call up in groups. The first panel is Benjamin Berbert, William Edward Green, William Hedgewood, Mike English, and Jane Lyons Reader. When you're ready, Mr. Berbert, you have three minutes. Thank you, members of the council. My name is Benjamin Berbert. I am here today representing comments from the planning board on ZTA 2401. The planning board is very supportive of the ZTA, which would provide options to create more affordable housing in uh, religious institution and private education institution properties throughout the county. We think this is a great way to help implement policies that were outlined in Thrive, as well as just the good thing to do. The planning board does, however, have five recommendations that it would like to make to make this a stronger ZTA. The first of which is a increase in the setback from land not part of the application from any of the buildings. Currently, the standards are listed at 20 feet. The planning board recommends increasing this to 25 feet, uh, in part to be consistent with the independent living facilities, conditional use that's already allowed in these similar zones that produces a very similar building type, as well as to provide just a little more flexibility for incompatibility. 
The second clarification we'd like to make is regarding the water and sewer connections on the RE2, RE2C, and RE1 zones. Um, as stated, it got a little muddy. I think the intent of this was that institutional properties that have received their water and sewer through a PIF policy or a public institutional facilities determination should be ineligible for this new use because um, we consider them to still be outside the water and sewer envelope. And that was really the intent, I think, behind that. And so we want to make that clarification. Uh, the third is that uh, a requirement should be being within a quarter mile of a public bus stop. Uh, this is inspiration taken from the conditional use allowed for townhouses in the design for life idea. Um, you know, part of what the planning board did wrestle with in its review was that some of these, particularly in those estate zones, could be pretty far away from employment centers, transit, and other things that make for complete communities, 15-minute living, and other impetuses of thrive. And so at least having access to public transit should be a minimum to ensure that residents of these facilities do have ways of getting to their jobs to school and to other uh, ways of recreating. The fourth recommendation is that the townhouse standards for conditional use uh, for the affordable housing should be expanded to all the residential detached zones. Um, currently, the ZTA allows all the residential detached zones to have multifamily living um, as part of the ZTA, but only applies to townhouses to the RE2 zone. Um, we're really not sure why we wouldn't want to have increased flexibility in building types, particularly it might make things a little more compatible in some of the tight down county situations. And the fifth recommendation was that in addition to the four criteria that would be eligible for affordability, um, that a fifth be expanded to help expand the reach of this ZTA, which would include the 4% uh, low income tax credits, in addition to the 9% low income tax credits, be an eligible criteria. Um, lastly, there was a climate assessment done on this. The blur did find slight negative impacts uh, mainly because of increased vehicle miles traveled, loss of green cover, potential water quality impacts, but there would be some positive impacts due to better community connectedness. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend William Amber Green. Thank you, Council President Friedson and members of the council. Although my congregation, Silver Spring United Methodist Church, hopes to develop affordable housing on our campus, I want to speak first to my personal interest in that work. When I was eight years old, we found toxic black mold in my house, rendering it unsafe for occupation. My single mother and I were homeless almost overnight. Now we were lucky, friends and family provided temporary shelter, but constantly moving took its toll on our mental, physical, and financial health. In the six months it took to find stable housing, my mother racked up $50,000 in debt that took her 12 years to pay off, something she did six months before collapsing and dying at 44 of an undiagnosed treatable condition because she couldn't afford to pay the bills, feed her family, and the insurance premiums required for treatment. The loss of stable housing had life-altering impacts long after my family secured affordable housing, and it still does every time we gather for a family event. Houses of Worship daily provide services to prevent the circumstances that led to my mother's death. My congregation serves approximately 3,000 county residents per week with a wide variety of recovery groups, mental health support, rental support, early childhood education, community concerts, lectures, and access to healthy foods. These are the values embodied in the bricks and mortars of our, house, our house, uh, houses of worship. In fact, statistics show that only about 9% of persons visiting houses of worship do so for religious education. My congregation, along with many others, has the resources, values, and will to prevent health outcomes like my mom's. But aging infrastructure and changing attendance trends mean that many face significant financial hurdles. All those services we offer at Silver Spring are offered by volunteers and staff, including every member of my staff team who live below 60% of the area median income. Some drive over 20 miles to just offer services in a county they can't afford to live in. Mm -hmm. Now, the Pew Institute estimates that by 2030, nearly one-third of all congregations in the United States will close. Much of their property, occupying $1.4 trillion in real estate, will be sold and developed as market rate luxury or commercial development. The loss of our faith communities and vital services they offer will have incalculable effects. Developing affordable housing can help congregations secure a sustainable future. There are potential financial benefits to our houses of worship. But more importantly, it is another tool and a toolkit we've had generations to develop, helping all of our communities not just survive, but thrive. The Faith ZTA significantly reduces barriers to congregation-led development, lowering the costs of rezoning and incentivizing creative redevelopment of church properties, while giving the congregations greater freedom and leverage when identifying their development partners. 
More importantly, it gives congregations the ability to ensure their property, even if they choose to close, continues building beloved community for our community on every corner of Montgomery County we call home. I speak today for Lynn, my mom, for the 12 people last week who our congregation assisted who were facing eviction, for my staff who can't live in a community they've dedicated their lives to serve. Let us help you serve them. Please consider voting yes on the CTA. Thank you very much and appreciate all of your work on this. Uh, William Hedgewood. You just need, you, uh, Mr. Hedgewood, you need to just hit your button. Perfect, and you have three minutes. Thank you. All right, great. Um, good afternoon, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to address you today. Uh, my name is William Hangwood, and I'm resident of Germantown. Uh, while I work in the human services field, striving to combat the pervasive issue of homelessness, today I stand, sit before you as an individual advocate. I'm here to express my full support of ZTA 24-01, also known as the Faith, uh, Faith uh, Initiative. This amendment represents a crucial stride in our ongoing efforts to rectify the deep-seated disparities within our housing system, particularly those rooted in historical and contemporary racial discrimination. Throughout the history of this country, governmental policies such as restrictive covenants, redlining and discriminatory housing practices have perpetuated the residential segregation and widened racial disparities in housing. These policies have entrenched uh, two uh, distinct housing systems, one bolstered by government support, fostering intergenerational wealth for white families, and the other marked by neglected BIPOC communities, where housing op options are scarce and wealth building opportunities are scarce as well. Uh, exclusionary uh, zoning has further ex exacerbated these disparities by restricting multifamily dwellings in residential areas, driving up housing costs and rendering home ownership unattainable for many BIPOC residents. ZTA 24-01 represents a shot in the arm for dismantling those barriers and addressing the systemic injustices that have mar marginalized BIPOC communities for generations. By eliminating obstacles to affordable housing development and in introducing flexibility and zoning regulations, GTA uh, 24-01 lays the groundwork for increased housing access in neighborhoods surrounding places of worship. Uh, this initiative not only addresses our urgent housing crisis, but also promotes environmental sustainability and economic empowerment for all residents. Uh, furthermore, ZTA 24-01 aligns seamlessly with the Montgomery Planning's equity agenda, prioritizing communities with high concentration of BIPOC constituents and low-income households by fostering opportunities for affordable housing in these equity focus areas. The legislation aims to redress past injustices and foster greater equity and inclusion within Montgomery County. In addition, finally, the significant impact of ZTA 24-01, uh, uh, in addition to the significant impact, we must also recognize the importance of complementary initiatives like ZTA 23-02. This initiative seeks to ex expedite, expedite excuse me, the regulatory review process for eligible multi-unit housing communities, therefore, thereby increasing the supply of affordable housing and addressing the overwhelming demand within our county. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mike English. Thank you for agreeing to hear my testimony. Uh, I'd also like to per personally second everything the previous two speakers have said. Um, but yes, Mike English, um, I'm here to uh, testify in support of ZTA 2401. And although I'll be providing my personal perspective as well, I am testifying on behalf of Montgomery for All. Uh, it's the grassroots uh, Montgomery County branch of the Coalition for Smarter Growth. We're over 200 members strong and are advocating for welcoming inclusive neighborhoods. You all know that Montgomery County has a dire housing shortage and there is no cure-all. The passage of 52050 led the way, and upcoming efforts on missing middle housing and various master plans will play a key role. But we believe this ETA can play an important part in providing more housing to meet the county's needs, while helping faith institutions leverage their land to help their con congregations and their surrounding communities, all while re leveraging on existing affordable housing programs in a clever and efficient way. By allowing faith institutions to build structures up to 60 feet if the projects meet one of four affordability thresholds, the ZTA would provide more opportunities for the kind of abundant, more affordable housing that we so desperately need, led by long-standing members of the community such a project would take place in. 
As I've talked about occasionally in my advocacy, I am not a person of faith, nor for that matter a believer in any sort of higher power. And I'd rather confidently guess that I'm among the most lapsed of Catholics. But people come to affordable housing from different places in different ways, as we've already heard today. And we should celebrate where we intersect. This is an opportunity to come together to create welcoming, inclusive communities. And I'm confident that that will be the result of this ETA. I like to think I do a lot for my community, but whatever my disagreements on scripture and tenets of faith, I know that a lot of people and institutions are motivi motivated by their faith to do as much and more, from helping the unhoused directly, to general community aid, to the institutions that might seek to balance their finances and help people find shelter at the same time under the ZTA. The belief that people should be housed safely and affordably is something that should unite us all and a value that should be reflected in our land use laws. As strongly as we support this legislation as it is currently written, we would still like to suggest an amendment that we believe would help the ZTA achieve its objective even more effectively. This allowance for religious institutions to build housing on their land should be by right, and if not by right, then should allow the fewest barriers to entry. Our understanding is that this could be achieved by making housing in the ZTA utilize the site plan review process rather than a conditional use. This legislation is a common sense, flexible, and significant step to help address our housing crisis while simultaneously giving more flexibility to institutions of faith to meet their needs and missions. We urge your support for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jane Lyons Reader. Uh, good afternoon and thank you. Uh, my name is Jane Lyons Reader and I'm a renter in downtown Silver Spring. I'm also a member and volunteer leader with Montgomery for All, but today I'm speaking as an individual. Um, I strongly support ZTA 2401, um, which you've already heard about what that would do. Uh, many of you know me through my advocacy work, but you might not know about my deep personal connection to the Episcopal Church. I grew up in the church, uh, and the Episcopal community and faith tradition remains a really huge part of my life, primarily with my connection to the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland's Camp Conference and Retreat Center, where I'm on the Board of Trustees. Um, and so although I've sometimes wrestled with my what my faith means to me in the past, from a young age I always felt called to social justice or liberation theology. Uh, and in many ways I view my advocacy work on affordable housing and land use as an expression of my faith and the Christian mission of caring for the vulnerable and disenfranchised. And I know that I'm not alone in this and there are many religious organizations, Christian and otherwise, who view affordable housing as an important ministry. For far too long, zoning laws have prevented religious groups from using such a precious resource, their land, to enact their faith. And if there are congregations willing to use their land for affordable housing, the county should do everything it can to encourage and assist them in that endeavor. Instead, for too long, our land use laws have effectively told our neighbors to look elsewhere for a home that they can afford. These housing projects would still have to meet a lot of standards. Um, I am particularly concerned by the requirement that new construction would have to be compatible with the height, density, coverage, and parking standards of surrounding usage, uses, especially since the CTA is intended to open up housing opportunity in neighborhoods that may have previously intentionally excluded townhomes or apartment buildings. Uh, so I would like to see um, in addition to that, I will echo what Mike said about by right, or if not that, using the site plan approval process, uh, whatever it is that uh, eliminates as many hurdles as possible. So I encourage the uh, PHP committee to think through some of those things um, and uh, work towards the goal of providing as much flexibility as possible. Uh, I am still enthusiastically supportive of the ZTA um, as a really great step towards more affordable communities. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate everybody joining us uh, here today. Our next uh, uh, panel is going to be Pris Priscilla Kenya, Dr. Reverend Michael Armstrong, Sarah Renninger, and Susan Albertine. Ms. Kenya, you have three minutes when you're ready. Yes, please. Perfect. <clears throat> All right. Good afternoon, President Fried, uh, Friedson, Vice President Stewart, and Council Members. My name is Priscilla Cania, AARP Volunteer Lead Advocate. AARP Maryland advocate, uh, advocates for more than 2 million Marylanders age 50 and older, uh, including approximately 400,000 in Montgomery County. We're here today to support the Zoning Text Amendment 2401. 
Thank you for allowing us to speak, and thank you to the sponsors and the council for introducing this important legislation. According to Realtor.com, the U.S. has a shortage of 2.3 to 6.5 million homes. The National Low Income Housing Coalition suggests that there's a dearth of 7.3 million affordable homes for low income families. Monica Bell from Yigby, which stands for Yes in God's Backyard, says when you're in the middle of a housing crisis, if you've got land, the best way to generate revenue and become socially relevant is build housing. Clearly, the Montgomery County Council has witnessed state and local governments around the country who have collaborated with local churches to minimize zoning restrictions and allow churches to use underutilized land to, use, to do just that, become socially relevant and build affordable housing. We greatly appreciate the vision of the local churches who will make this happen. But for a minute, let's talk about older residents. One in three Americans is age 50 or older. <clears throat> By 2030, not too long from now, one in five will be over 65. By 2034, 10 years from now, um, adults 65 plus will outnumber children. Many older adults live on fixed and or limited incomes, falling well below the 50% area median income. Housing is very limited for older people needing financial assistance. Almost half of adults <coughs> 50 <coughs> plus who are homeless became unhoused for the first time later in life. The proposed legislation has excellent language and intent to provide housing for households earning less than 60% of the AMI. However, there's nothing specific to older residents, and we wonder if you would consider adding language to Section D2, subsection IIF, 1, 2, and 3. The dwelling must meet one of the following affordability thresh thresholds that includes a minimum percentage for older households. Montgomery County has been at the forefront of many excellent socially responsible programs. We thank the council and the area churches and fully support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Dr. Reverend Michael Armstrong. Good afternoon, council. I'm the Reverend Dr. Michael Armstrong, pastor of Colesville United Methodist Church in Silver Spring, Maryland, and co-chair of Action in Montgomery. I'm here today to represent AIM and our support for the Montgomery County Faith ZTA. First, we'd like to thank the sponsors of this legislation and the whole council for your support. Action Montgomery is a coalition of 30 congregations, nonprofits, and schools working to address key issues facing everyday people in our communities. Over the past 20 years, we've worked on affordable housing as a primary focus, working with the council and executive to support over a billion dollars for affordable housing and housing initiative fund, supporting counselors countless projects for development and the preservation of affordable housing development on specific sites throughout the county and increasing the density of housing and affordable housing near transit. In AIM, we initiate all of our organizing work by holding listening sessions, asking neighbors to share what gets in the way of them and their families thriving. Across the board, the issue we hear most frequently is the need for affordable housing. In fact, there are few families who are not, who, there are few families who are not affected by this problem of affordable housing in their, one of their family's generations, be it seniors, middle-aged blue-collar workers, or young professional college graduates. My own daughter is struggling to purchase her first home. She graduated from Bennett College and stayed in North Carolina for eight years, paying down her college loans and saving for a down payment. She found multiple first-time owner, owner programs there and properties she could afford. When she decided to return home and accept an upwardly mobile position as a public servant, the high housing prices mean she's not mortgage ready in Maryland. Although she's a public employee with a decent salary, she's been struggling for four years to find affordable home that she could purchase. To address this problem, we strongly believe there's a need to develop more affordable housing to meet the growing need. It's been proven that affordable housing is one of the ways to get families out of poverty, bring stability to a family, build generational wealth, and leave a legacy for succeeding generations. We also believe with the continuing concerns around vehicle pollutants, it's essential need to build transit-oriented affordable housing. A large portion nonprofit congregational land is close to bus and transit lines, making this land a bonus for usage. I know 
that some of our religious nonprofit organizations are considering repurposing some of their property assets for affordable housing, but only if some of them can overcome the particular zoning challenges they face. This bill would go a long way towards making it financially feasible for these organizations to be a part of the solution for affordable housing in our communities and provide much more affordable housing than we could otherwise. It will also allow us to live more fully into our missions to serve the community, addressing the pressing needs around us. We know the need for affordable housing continues to grow, and this legislation will be an effective good start to stem the tide. We know our nonprofit religious organizations stand ready to roll up their sleeves and do their parts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Armstrong. I appreciate that. Our next speaker, Sarah Redinger. Hey, good afternoon, council members. Uh, for the record, my name is Sarah Redinger, and I'm the Vice President of Community Development with Habitat for Humanity Metro Maryland. We are a nonprofit provider of affordable housing, working to provide equitable access to home ownership in Montgomery County since 1982. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Habitat enthusiastically supports ZTA 2401 and things lead sponsors Council President Friedson and Vice President Stewart, as well as the long list of co-sponsors on this bill as well. We all know that our county and the nation are facing a tremendous housing crisis. Too many of our neighbors pay more than 50% of their income on housing when 30% is considered affordable. So each day, these families are making impossible choices between paying for housing and food, childcare, healthcare, transportation, and education. And to address this crisis, we must develop more housing that is affordable to families of, with lower incomes. CTA 2401 smartly promotes the development of affordable housing on faith and educational institution-owned land, facilitating partnership between mission-based organizations to achieve public benefit. Beyond benefiting residents through affordable housing, the ZTA benefits religious and educational institutions as it provides a mission-minded revenue stream allowing institutions to realize the value of their land. This is another tool that we can use to affordably and safely house more Montgomery County residents. We also appreciate that the ZTA includes the expansion of townhome developments in addition to multi-unit living. Attached homes often provide more affordable ownership opportunities for families otherwise locked out of the traditional housing market. And I think we all know that that disproportionately affects families of color. And that in Montgomery County, we have a racial ownership gap between white and black and African American households that own their homes of over 35%. Importantly, the ZTA could help families access affordable ownership and build generational wealth. Habitat urges the council to pass ZTA 2401 in a manner that balances the need for public comment while ensuring a level of certainty affordable developers need to pursue projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Susan Albertine. Good afternoon, members of council. I am Susan Albertine. I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County. The League supports ZTA 2401. We support comprehensive efforts to maintain and increase the supply of affordable housing through many mechanisms, including changes in zoning and flexible approaches. This legislation would do just that by opening the door to increase the supply of housing that is affordable for moderate and lower income families and individuals. This ZTA frees up land that is underutilized by religiously affiliated organizations and private educational institutions for the development of multi-unit and townhouse dwellings. Montgomery County has an affordability problem and it starts with housing. Per the 2020 Montgomery County Housing Needs Assessment, since 2010, about half of all new households earn less than 50,000 annually. 10 years ago, the county was short more than 26,000 units for households earning up to 50% of the area medium income, the AMI. Four years later, that gap had increased to 65%. Meanwhile, households in higher income ranges experienced an increase in the number of available units. For the rental market, today's median rent for a three-bedroom house in Montgomery County is $2,729 dollars per month for a family of four, or $32,748 per year. This is equivalent to almost half the income of those families who earn 50% of AMI. That's $73,350 per year. That is unsustainable and makes it increasingly difficult for families to build financial security. Rising rents and home prices, increasing interest rates, stagnant wages and aging homes 
have fostered a two-class system in our county. People with generational wealth and an income greater than the AMI and people without. Those least able to financially cope continue to bear the burden of limited affordable housing. When administered wisely and with proper oversight, creative measures such as ZTA 2401 provide necessary opportunities to improve the county's overall livability. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to comment on legislation that will impact all residents. Thank you very much to everybody who's joined us in person. We're going to turn to some virtual testimony, starting with Mary Kohler. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Kohler, and I'm testifying on behalf of Montgomery Housing Alliance. MHA strongly supports ZTA 2401, and we propose modifications to strengthen the ZTA as a tool to meaningfully increase affordable housing. Over the past several years, the Council has prioritized housing, especially affordable housing, and made major strides on the issue. Yet we know we still must add tens of thousands of units of housing over the ne next decade, the majority of which must be affordable to low to moderate income households. Innovative strategies like ZTH 2401 will allow the county to meaningfully build on the important progress we have made. We urge you to support the ZTA, but to amend it to include multi-unit and townhouse living as allowable through the site plan approval process rather than as a conditional use. This would streamline the process further and be less onerous for faith communities or private educational institutions partnering with affordable housing providers while still allowing for community input and involvement. The conditional use process includes the step of review by the Office of Zoning and Administrative Hearings. Requiring site plan approval instead would mean the project would go directly to the planning department where it would be reviewed by staff open to public hearing and subject to a decision by the planning board before permitting could proceed. The site plan approval process better allows for objective standards and determinations in the OZAH, which relies on the determination of a single hearing examiner. We recognize and support the need for community input. One of the primary intents of the ZTA is to allow houses of worship and private educational institutions to better use their resources to support their neighbors and surrounding communities. The site plan approval process provides adequate opportunities for public input while bringing to bear the kind of objective evaluation of that input applied to other significant developments in the, in the county. At the very least, we urge you to eliminate language that could invite a more subjective disapproval of projects. In particular, under use standards, we urge you to eliminate the term maximize when referencing the need for, com for compatibility of the project. Maximize compatibility adds a dimension not in the standards for conditional use for household living today. If included, it could be used to make a bad faith argument that any building other than a detached single family home would not maximize compatibility, undermining the intent of the ZTA. As a county, we know the housing targets we need to meet, and we know that to meet them, we need numerous strategies and tools. ZTA 2401 would provide one such important tool. It not only promotes increases in affordable housing, but does so in a way that allows mission-minded community leaders to better serve their neighbors. MHA strongly supports CTA 2401, and we urge you to further strengthen the measure so it can have a greater impact on meeting the county's housing needs. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Quentin Romain. Uh, my name is uh, Council President Friedson and Council Members. My name is Quentin Romain, President of Cloverleaf Civic Association. I've lived over 40 years at 201 Bryant Searcy Road, Silver Spring, Maryland. The ZTA replaces lower density residential development with urban zoning with no affordable housing benefit that we see in our area. The Montgomery County 2050 plan clearly states that concentrating development in urban centers instead of permitting sprawl benefits suburban and rural areas. Churches and educational institutes have been have drawn uh, to have been drawn to large lot residential land because of properties that's uh, of great enough size that are not available in the urban and agricultural areas. Large residential lot zoning was created by the wedges and quarters plan because of the poor soils for building found in many areas of uh, Montgomery County, such as Cloverly. In many areas, the zoning was not even enough to protect soils from erosion, stream pollution, and flooding, so special protection overlays were created to provide greater limitations on how much of the lot could be uh, covered with buildings and pavement. This is now 
only 3,400 feet can be used uh, for uh, your building and, and pavement. This is approximately equal to R30 already. Although residents cannot build on the land, that additional land, they have an excellent opportunity to take good care of the land, provide for habitat for animals, birds, insects, aquatic life, large trees, and tree canopy. We are protecting the county from more air, pollu air and stream pollution, stream erosion, uh, there's less stormwater runoff and flooding. With fewer households, there would be fewer costs for roads, public transportation, schools, parks, libraries, fire and emergency services, and other amenities. Under current zoning, a church wanting to develop two acres of housing could sell the property to build one RE2 home. Under the ZTA 2401, a church would be exempt from the R2 zoning constraints and could build on each two acres 29 townhouses or 29 apartments, of which only a third or a half are affordable for 30 years. This housing would not protect the environment from harm. Additionally, the county would be required to provide for more public amenities for these residents. Would someone really like to live in this type of affordable housing? Their communities would not be walkable. They would, not, they would require a car for shopping and commuting, which is a great expense. They would not uh, experience more tra they would experience more traffic congestion and greater commuting times and have less uh, free time uh, commuting to their outlying areas. Have, uh, they'd have little or no public transportation and have fewer choices for utilities. Our suburban and rural community already has many affordable housing units and we are not Potomac. They are affordable forever. More needs to be done to protect them from gentrification and citizens being taxed off their land. Right now we have many, uh, many of the residents in the Cloverly area are, res are descendants of freed slaves from 1844. They're being taxed off their land and they have been uh, subject to gentrification and used by uh, commercial activities taking over their land. Although ZTA 2401 sounds like a good idea, Please place more conditions on this zoning uh, amendment or reject this uh, zoning amendment entirely. I see a lot of good uses for this, and I think there are in the urban zones, but not in the, the uh, outline, outline zones. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker, Mary Renderos. Hi, my name is Mary Renderos, and I'm representing Jubilee Association of Maryland. Jubilee provides residential and housing supports to over 180 adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities in Montgomery County, Maryland. We support the Faith CTA as it directly addresses the pressing need for affordable housing in Montgomery County. Many of the people we support dream of living in their own homes, not homes owned by a service provider. Yet safe, accessible, and affordable housing options are limited. The economic challenge for people with disabilities is stark. No person receiving just SSI can afford a one bedroom apartment. They would need to pay 170% of their income towards rent. People with disabilities require deeply affordable housing near transit to best provide for community engagement and living their best lives. As an organization founded by Hyattsville Mennonite Church in 1978, Jubilee understands the transformative impact of partnerships with religious institutions in tackling societal challenges. Jubilee has successfully collaborated with religiously affiliated organizations to advance affordable housing initiatives, such as the six homes where we support people um, that are owned by Rosaria Communities, which is affiliated with the Archdiocese of Washington, and a home owned by Potomac Community Resources on land made available from Our Lady of Mercy Parish. These partnerships have demonstrated the power of community-driven solutions in creating independent living opportunities for people with disabilities. We eagerly anticipate the opportunity to extend our support and tech technical expertise to other organizations committed to expanding affordable housing options that include adults with disabilities. Overall, ZTA 2401 aligns with Jubilee's mission of providing opportunities and support for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities to live in and enrich their community while fulfilling their personal, family, social, and spiritual needs. Thank you so much for your efforts. Thank you. And our last speaker for this item, Ellen Mann.
Thank you very much. Thank you. We can hear you. Okay. You can't see yes. you, but we can hear you. Thank you very much. Council members, my name is Ellen Mann, and my response to this CTA is no, unless carefully amended to protect the environment. I live in an area which is heavily populated by a nonprofits. Within a one and a half mile radius of Cloverly, there are at least 100 churches, many of which are on large lots. These churches decided to build dense housing on their properties. The result would be massive deforestation, which is, as you know, is a major cause of global warming. In fact, trees are, and forests are essential to the human existence. They are major carbon sinks, they protect streams from flooding, and they provide us with oxygen, amongst other things. So before you vote on this CTA, I'd like you all to take a drive to Cloverly and look at the, the property at 15730 New Hampshire Avenue. A very large church purchased 15 and a half acres of intact forest, and they have already completely decimated 10 acres. There's nothing else there. It is estimated that one acre of forest can sequester two and a half to three and a half tons of carbon per year. So that destroyed 10 acres has already released at least 35 tons of carbon into the atmosphere. In addition, this destruction of forests is sited at the headwaters of the Northwest Branch with no forests to protect those headwaters. What will happen with the next couple of severe downpours? In my mind, this is a snapshot of what is the future of this county will be if this ETA passes with no amendments for the environment. As a consequence, I recommend that to be exempted are all properties which are zoned RE2, RE2C, and RE1, and to absolutely ensure that the townhouses and apartments constructed on these nonprofits must be located with one mile of a metro station. Otherwise, my vote is no. Council members, what do you want your legacy to be? Do you want to be known as people who produce low-cost low housing that is subject to flooding, wildfires, et cetera, due to increased climate change? Or do you want to be known as people who provided low-cost housing with careful consideration to mitigating climate change for the good of the earth and for all of us? The vote and the choice are yours. Thank you for your testimony. Those are all the speakers that we have signed up for that public hearing. So that public hearing is now closed. Move on to item four, public hearing, police statistical data as required by Bill 4520. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business on March 7th, 2024. There are no speakers for this hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. We are going to move on to agenda item number five. This is zoning, uh, where the council is going to sit as the district council for action, uh, which we're going to all address in a moment. Um, for zoning text amendment, ZTA 2310, parking, queuing, and loading, calculation of required parking. The Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee recommends enactment with amendment. Uh, before I give some introductory remarks, we did receive a very last minute, last ditch request from the county executive uh, requesting for bond council review. I will note that this came in less than an hour before today's council session, months after this measure was introduced. Uh, I am going to suggest in light of that, despite the disappointment that I have in the uh, lack of time that the executive branch has provided uh, for this and my own personal views of the reasoning behind it, uh, that we have a full work session today, that we go through each of the items, that we be prepared with uh, a final zoning text amendment, uh, but in the interest of additional prudence, that we uh, hold off on a final roll call vote until next week. So unless there are any concerns or objections from colleagues, uh, I think that's how we're going to move forward. So. Uh, it will not be action uh, on this zoning text amendment. It will be uh, a work session on this zoning text amendment, but we will be taking votes on 
amendments and we'll just be holding off uh, on the final roll call uh, vote for final passage. I uh, want to welcome uh, guests uh, from the planning department who I believe are uh, here. We have Ms. Nadu, who I really wanted to express my appreciation for all of her hard work. This has not been an easy uh, measure. wanted to, to thank and acknowledge Councilmember Mink and Councilmember Glass for their uh, efforts and, and leadership in, in co-leading uh, this uh, effort, which we've been working on for, for many, many months, uh, over a year now. Uh, and all colleagues for your unanimous support of the overarching measure uh, as uh, co-sponsors. We had a number of people come out and testify in support of this measure, housing advocates, transit advocates, those concerned with environmental sustainability. Uh, we uh, move this forward to increase housing affordability and to encourage sustainable transit-oriented development to help meet our climate goals. Our collaboration led to the measure before us as introduced, reflective of the consensus that the three lead sponsors uh, had on this issue. And the PHP committee supported nearly all the elements of the original uh, legislation with uh, a small number of outstanding items which we'll discuss today. We have an affordable housing crisis, like so many across the nation. Housing here in Montgomery County is simply out of reach for far too many people. And currently with the requirement that is you know, in many ways, oftentimes outdated, uh, something that was put in place 40 years ago, the cost of parking is tens of thousands of dollars added to the housing cost, even for those who don't need or don't desire parking becomes completely out of reach. This measure will help contain housing costs in some of our most desirable areas of the county near and in close proximity to transit to help us to move forward with our non-auto driver mode share goals and to address the climate crisis as we simultaneously try to address our housing crisis. We need to do everything in our power to reduce the cost of housing, to make it easier to live here, to be the type of inclusive, welcoming community that we talk about and that we strive to be, while encouraging people to walk, bike, and take transit, and to become the type of walkable, accessible community uh, that we uh, desire. Less parking means more space for people and a reduced environmental footprint. I hope that we will move forward with this measure after today's consensus and next week's final passage so that we can prioritize people over parking. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my uh, co-lead uh, sponsors uh, now uh, if they'd like to speak and then uh, can go through the committee recommendations and get into the work session. Let me start with Councilmember Glass. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the work that uh, the PHP committee has done to get us where we are, and once again appreciate all members of the council for co-sponsoring uh, this uh, zoning text amendment, recognizing that we are in a housing crisis, and the best way to provide more housing is by making it more affordable to do so. And we know that parking spaces, particularly in our downtown areas, cost here in Montgomery County on average between seventy and one hundred thousand dollars. And while there are people who need parking, they will continue to have parking. And for those who do not need parking or choose not to have parking, um, they can have the option, thereby reducing the overall cost of, of housing as well. Um, Mr. President, you, you noted at the uh, uh, onset, 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 excuse me, uh, of this conversation, uh, the last minute concerns from, from the county executive. Uh, I do not share those concerns, uh, but I do have concerns uh, with going through a work session and uh, uh, not engaging in what their concerns are. Um, if their concerns are central to the amendments and the discussion we're going to have right now, then uh, I'm concerned it renders some of that moot. Uh, and so uh, I, I defer to you, uh, but I think it's most important to hear from the county executives team at the upfront uh, so that if there are an amendments or discussion, we, we get to hear what those are. But I'll say that I'm very comfortable voting for this today. Well, we certainly can hear from the executive branch if you want. What the executive branch requested, as you know, because it came to uh, our inboxes less than an hour before this meeting uh, began, it's to review with bond council whether or not this would have a negative 
fiscal impact on parking lot districts. I'll note that the current rate is zero, and so there's an understandable question of what that fiscal impact uh, would be. I, I'm sure that Director Conklin or others could share with you that they are requesting an analysis from Bond Council, but the, the county executive and his administration has not even reached out to Bond Council yet. They sent us with before an hour before the meeting an indication that they intended to reach out to Bond Council several months after the introduction of this measure to ask Bond Council whether or not uh, there is a, a fiscal concern uh, related to the bond issuance in the parking lot districts. I don't think that has a direct impact on the individual amendments that we're going to discuss and debate here. It has an impact on whether or not there are fiscal concerns about passage at all and whether or not uh, you know the council wishes to move forward uh, in light of whether or not there are concerns by the executive that we can't finance that. But at the appropriate time, once we get through the committee work, we can invite the executive branch up, and you're welcome to ask any questions as you see well, fit. And, and, and I appreciate that, and I agree with your summation, which is why I think we're able to vote on it today, because either their concerns are germane or they're not. And if they are not, then we can vote on it today. If, they're, if their concerns are legitimate, then I think it inhibits the entire discussion that we're about to have. Okay, so are you asking colleagues if they would prefer to move forward today? Is that I'm simply saying I, I am prepared to move forward today because either their concerns are legitimate and they need to be taken up in today's conversation or they are not germane and then they'd be dismissed later on, which is why then we can just vote on it today. Okay. Just, your, I'm just sharing my thoughts. Your point of view has been noted. I'll turn it over to Councilmember Mick. Um, I would support the plan to go through a work session today, hopefully get a, bill, uh, a ZTA that's ready to be teed up to be voted on, um, give the executive branch a week to bring to us concerns, um, and um, hopefully uh, we'll still be in a place where we feel comfortable voting and passing this, but um, I, I'm happy to, in, in good faith, give that uh, limited amount of time there to give the opportunity to bring us concerns that could, uh, you know, change our, did you, did you? Okay. We'll bring up the executive branch later. So okay. you, you can wait <laughs> and um, we'll, 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 we'll give you, we'll give you time to okay. express your point of view, notwithstanding mm -hmm. the incredibly late nature that it came in. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing a way that this would change where I would vote on amendments or change the substance of the discussion that we're going to have here about the content of the ZTA. Um, so I'm comfortable having that, having that session today and, and think that the time will be well spent. want to express my appreciation to the committee for very fine work uh, going through this ZTA. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and to council staff, really just uh, incredibly uh, fantastic, thorough, thoughtful work, uh, and I'm ready to move forward with the conversation. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. I share the views as well. I don't have concerns about moving forward today, but in you know, in the interest of ensuring that colleagues are comfortable and in light of the last minute uh, request, uh, you know, uh, holding off for one week, at, you know, after we go through the substance of the uh, items, uh, you know, would, would you know appears to be prudent. It appears that that is the will of uh, of the overwhelming uh, number of the body. So. Uh, with uh, with that, why don't I turn it over to? Uh, oh, sorry. Before I do that, let me turn it over to Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I know when the executive branch comes forward, there was ambiguity in the email on timing of how long it would take the bond rating agency to review this, and obviously that's very relevant and germane to this conversation. Um, I uh, concur with the council president's recommendation. I appreciate Councilmember Glass's um, thoughts on this, but. Uh, I do think it's worth us going through the work session today um, to keep the ball rolling uh, and whenever the, such time the bond rating agency completes its review and confirms what I think is going to be accurate, which this is a lot to do about nothing, um, we can move forward right away. But timing is going to be important. 
appreciate that. Okay, we will get to the timing of this because this is not an indefinite hold. I, you know, there are views of whether or not this is coming out of genuine concern or whether it's coming out of opposition outright. Uh, we can get to that, and I think the timing of the response uh, from bond council matters in that regard. But why don't we go through the committee conversation and discussion, and once we get through that, we will get to the executive branch. So with that, let me turn it to Ms. Nadu. If you can walk through the elements of the zoning text amendment, the discussion during planning, housing, and parks, uh, we do have a recommendation from the committee, uh, but a couple outstanding items that we need to discuss here today. Absolutely. So the recommendation from the committee was for approval with one amendment the committee agreed on and one that will be discussed today with full council because the vote was 111. Um, as a sort of big picture item, I haven't asked how parking is calculated. Um, and so there's a table in the zoning ordinance, it's 624B, the relevant portions of which are on page four of the staff report. Um, and that just shows that based on the use, that's how you figure out what the parking is going to be. The list of uses that will be affected is on page five. So I just wanted to start there on what uses and parking requirements we're looking at. Um, so next, the amendments, starting with page six. The amendment that the committee agreed on is a clarifying amendment. So at the top of section 623, where the adjustments to parking are, um, it says that you can't make any exceptions. So we're just adding in there that you can make this exception in this ZTA. So that language is on page six of your packet and the committee had all agreed with that. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the big one now, which is the discussion about BRT. I. Ha did make a quick PowerPoint, mostly because there's a lot of maps involved, um, although I think if I remember, there we go, we have some options. <laughs> so there are five options here. Um, I think the easiest way to do this is I will quickly tell you what all five are, and then you can run through each of them one at a time if that works for the body. So the first option is the way that the language was introduced, which said quarter mile of an existing BRT station or a BRT station funded for construction in the six years CIP at the time of application. Um, option B is from the planning board who requested that the ZTA use the term non-rail transit way rather than um, enter into a discussion at each application about what BRT is. Um, option C uses the phrase dedicated right of way, so a BRT with a dedicated right of way to sort of narrow what the council means by BRT. Option D clarifies that slightly by saying it's BRT along a route where at least 50% of the route is dedicated. And then the final option is to remove BRT from the ZTA altogether. So starting with, oh, well, since this is about what a BRT is, this is what a BRT station looks like. So it's not every bus stop, it's not every bus route, it is, this is what is usually envisioned when we talk about BRT, and this is a photo from the DOT website. So, uh, this is DOT's map of our upcoming flash network. So all of this does not exist at the moment, but this is the vision, the dream, the goal. I think the easiest way for the council to approach this is to sort of think about two questions. One, how expansive would you like the ZTA to be? And then that can help define also what the policy goals here is the idea that every BRT station you should be able to use and not use parking. So option A, as introduced, um, as I noted, it specifically refers to the CIP and just says BRT. From council staff's perspective, a plain language reading of that is if you pull up a CIP PDF and it calls it BRT, it is BRT. And so the three routes that currently exist that are either fully running or are um, funded for construction in the current CIP are 29, Veers Mill, and 355. On page seven, you will see the number of stations. I'll note, I was also given the number of platforms, which is helpful, because remember, there's a bus set, a stop at each side of the street. Um, so those are the three that exist. I listed New Hampshire and North Bethesda, because those are ones that could come up in future, um, BR, uh, in future CIPs. So that is option one. Um, I did meet with DOT, they confirmed, because at the work session, there was a lot of discussion on whether Route 29 would count. Something important here is Route 29 does meet those federal, state, and local guidelines for BRT. 
and also the council the county receives funding based on what we are defining as BRT so that's important as well that we don't want to suddenly say something isn't BRT because we would like that funding so we can continue to grow that infrastructure um, so that is the walkthrough of option A, do you want me to go through all of them and then discuss? Why don't you go through all the options and then we can open it up for discussion. Perfect. That was my preference. So um, next up is the planning board's recommendation, which is to use the term non-rail transitway. So the, um, the impetus for this concern was that there are many residents who would say, well, Route 29 isn't fully done. These BRT routes aren't flushed out. It's the BRT we have versus the BRT we dream of. And so to instead use the term non-rail transitway, and it'll use transitways as defined in our master plan, and non-rail transitways just means all the ones that aren't rail. So using this map, that would include all the routes in orange, blue, and the light blue, I will note DOT did look at this map and said the GSTN would not actually be included, so you can ignore the green and yellow for now. Um, and so that is planning's recommendation. I will note that it does technically include the same roads. It is still Route 29, 355, and Veers Mill Road. Um, also, we do reference BRT in other parts of the zoning ordinance, but in those cases, it's usually the route that we're referring to and not the station. And, you know, those ETAs are a little older, so things have developed, and this is a new concern for planning. Next up, um, sorry, I don't have another map for this one. I'll go back one. Um, this was about why BRT is included. Um, speaking and speaking to the lead sponsors and at the work session, Chair Friedson had noted, the idea here was those routes with the dedicated right-of-way are very like flushed out, easily accessible, so you really wouldn't need parking. You're getting from point A to point B very fast. So the proposed language is to say a bus rapid transit station with a dedicated right-of-way. Um, and so that's the option C, so the third option. Um, I did receive a comment, um, a suggestion from planning to maybe say dedicated transit lane. This is a fully grammatical question for the council. Um, the way I had written it, the thought was dedicated right-of-way is modifying bus rapid transit station, but technically every right-of-way is dedicated. So that's just a grammatical correction if we go with that option. Next up, um, because the question is, say for example, you have Route 29, which has some dedicated. If you're saying with a dedicated right-of-way, does that mean it has to be dedicated in front of the station? Does it mean the whole road is dedicated? So to provide some guidance to Planning Board and DOT, um, the clarifying language from Council Member Mink would be quarter mile of an existing BRT station on a route with at least 50% dedicated right-of-way. So the way I'd explain this is let's say you have a whole road and 50% of it has dedicated. In fact, even better, let's say you have a road and half of it's dedicated and it's only on the top half. All the stations along the whole route would be exempt from parking because most of the route has dedicated lanes. This works if the idea is anywhere on that route, you're getting better transit, so it's okay that the dedicated piece isn't in front of your station. There's one way to argue that. And then our final option, is to remove BRT from the ZTA altogether. One, if there's a thought that there's a lot of confusion and the council needs time to work this out but wants to move forward on the ZTA. Second, during committee, we did talk about adding mark stations. The committee chose not to do that with this idea that mark stations aren't the pedestrian-friendly built-up network we want, and arguably that could apply to BRT. So those are all your maps and all your options. <laughs> Nothing. Oh, sorry, real quick, I will note the TNE committee did review the CIP on this yesterday because the way a ZTA works, it's, it's effective 20 days after adoption, so there'll be a weird gap where some people will be using the prior CIP and then when you pass this one and we're in a new fiscal year because it's going to be based on the date you apply. So whatever CIP we are in when the application is submitted is what will apply. So these were the routes that were approved at TNE yesterday. And that is it for me. Thank you for that. I'll just note uh, there were many options that were put forward. I had put forward a suggestion uh, in order to address some of the concerns. Uh, you know, my you know personal view is the zoning text amendment, as introduced, is probably the simplest way to do this. We do have bus rapid transit that is identified in 
the CIP, uh, while we try to solve the issues that have been addressed, I think we've created more problems perhaps than we've solved. So even though there was something identified as my suggestion, it was something that I put forward at committee for the purpose of uh, discussion, uh, you know, I, I still think that th the goal here is to ensure that we have bus rapid transit that is included. We don't want to go beyond that. We don't want to go less than that, and we don't want to risk what BRT is and what we have moved it forward on or the funding and applications that we have uh, moving forward. So um, I appreciate uh, all of the efforts, myself included, to try to uh, address some of that, but I think we have overcomplicated something that is not that complicated and uh, have you know potentially undermined the, the goal here and created other problems that we don't need to create. So my personal view is, you know, if, if you know, if, 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 there's one that's identified under my name, but I wouldn't support that over uh, the zoning text amendment as uh, introduced, but look forward to the discussion and we can see uh, where this conversation goes. Councilmember Albernaz. Sorry, thank you. Just a couple of questions. Um, where does Route 29 fit in all of this? Um, is it under the 50% and how would that be impacted? So Route 29 does not currently have 50% dedicated right of way, so it would not be you would not get the exemption. Okay, thank you. If you use the dedicated right of way language. Gotcha. I'll have more questions, but that's it for now. <laughs> Councilman uh, Fanny Gonzalez. I'm going to stick with my recommendation PHB. I think we should go with option B, which is a planning board recommendation with edits from council staff. Um, call it a non-rail transit way instead of BRT, and you guys can read it in front of you, keeping it simple. I thought it was very straightforward, and that's it. Should, we should not be complicating this. So option B for me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. Uh, so I guess my, my uh, concern is that uh, construction in the six-year CIP, um, that is um, fungible in terms of whether the project is actually going to be built within six years. And we've seen that many times where a project has construction funding and it's, and it's not not only uh, is it not fund, it's not constructed within six years, it's possible that it's never constructed. So my, I am concerned about the construction uh, in covering um, a BRT uh, with the funding, if, if it's not already constructed. Um, and so I don't know if you had the discussion about just existing BRT or something that's not six years out. I don't know if that discussion was made, so I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll ask that one question. But then the other question, um, and I signed on to this um, looking at uh, Metro and BRT, because for me, a Metro station is more than just people who ride the Metro. Metro station is often a transit hub with many other um, uh, bus lines that come and go from that. If we look at the 355 North, it's simply one uh, bus going up one area and without any other connection, without any other connectivity. So I am concerned about about that. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll stop there. Those are my two concerns. Well, I appreciate it. I'll say on the second point, just my perspective, uh, BRT is transit, so I, I think we have to make a decision of whether or not we consider BRT transit or not. That one line is one line up the you know, skeleton of the western portion uh, of the county from up county to down county, and it connects to metro, it connects to local bus routes, it is uh, you know, a significant portion of that. So I think that's just, that, you know, that is an existential policy question of whether or not uh, there is a view that bus rapid transit is in fact transit and should be treated as such, and that's a legitimate policy question that we uh, can have at this day. As I feel strongly that it is and, and should be treated as such. Uh, the 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 uh, the other question is about 
funding in the CIP, I think it's important to note that these are prospective decisions. So the balance here that we're trying to address is an approval and a requirement for a building that is going to be part of the built environment for 40 to 70 years. We have many, actually most of our buildings, particularly our residential buildings in Montgomery County, were built before 1950. 1960, certainly before 1970, uh, we you know the, 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 just by numbers, by percentage, and so the 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 question there is once we say that it's going to be funded, we should be funding it. That's a different question, um, but that's why it's not design; it's construction. Because generally, when things get advanced to construction, they do move forward. And sometimes they never make it to, to construction, which is you know part part of the uh, part of the dynamic, but again, that's a, that that is a public policy question of at what point do you want to be prospective, and at what point do you want to wait till something has happened? If you wait till something has happened, you may have built, you know, the the private sector is going to be building in anticipation of the infrastructure that is coming, and so by the time if you wait until everything is completed, all of the infrastructure is completed, the private infrastructure and the public infrastructure might already all be mostly built and therefore you will have missed the opportunity to bring down the cost of housing and to actually accomplish uh, what what the goal here is but th that is you know speaking only for myself but in the consensus that was reached by the uh, the lead sponsors that was my perspective of the consensus that we had reached of trying to find the balance of how can we ensure that we are doing this at a point that is early enough that it actually makes an impact to address our housing goals and address our climate concerns while ensuring that it's real and it's serious and that it's going to move forward. I think that the way it was introduced accomplishes that, but certainly that's why we're having this discussion. Um, I just want to just comment. The, the, I know that it happens rarely. But one of the times that it did happen was with the Quarter Cities Transit Way that was a project that was just about ready to be built. It was shovel ready for, for 10 years and, it, and, it, and it's gone. And so it does happen and, and that's just concerning. So I just wanted to say that. It's a fair point. I also just want to note there are people who question whether or not parking minimums are an appropriate public policy anywhere, whether the market should be deciding whether or not parking is necessary, whether the private sector financing, whether the people who are looking for housing should determine what it is they think that they need. We don't regulate washer and dryers. We don't regulate you know, countertops. We don't regulate sinks. We, we allow people who are renting and purchasing housing to make decisions of what they need, and we trust the fact that uh, you know, certain uh, financing and certain private sector decisions are going to be made uh, based on that, it is in this rare case where we are extremely prescriptive of you know what needs to be built in conjunction with housing. In this particular case, it is perhaps the most expensive thing that you could possibly require, and that's part of what uh, brings uh, housing up. I, there are important points that you've raised. Let me turn it over to Councilmember Glass. Uh, thank you very much. So when. Uh, you, Council President, and Councilmember Mink and I were working on this. Um, I had three goals in mind. Um, first, it was to make housing more affordable. Second, it was to encourage more transit usage. Um, and three, and the third one's a little tricky, but it was to promote the best level BRT that we could. And in working on the language, which we're now debating now, particularly with BRT. Um, it was a hope of mine to tie the level of service to BRT uh, to this zoning so that more people who uh, support this measure would encourage us vis-a-vis -vis the CIP and general policy making to support real dedicated BRT everywhere that it's being built. Since this has been introduced and we've been learning more about BRT in general and just yesterday having the T&E committee work session on the expansion of BRT, 
we've learned that it's not that simple, that federal guidelines um, are such that dedicated lanes are not even a requirement for certain projects to be considered BRT. Um, when, the, when the president comes back, I'd like to bring up Director Conklin, um, uh, so he'll call you back up. Uh, but it, it's important to get a, an understanding of what BRT is, how it's classified, um, and what our parameters are around it. So that's the promotion of, of the best BRT we can. So let me go back to the two other goals. Making housing more affordable. According to the Parking Reform Network, the elimination of parking uh, requirements or the promotion of parking, uh, elimination of parking minimums um, in hundreds of jurisdictions around the country have shown that there's been a decrease in rents and mortgages by the tune of 200 to $500 a month. That is um, not insignificant. And as we look across the county, uh, we should strive to have more manageable rents and mortgages everywhere. So that's an argument for this to, to be along all the, the BRT corridors. Um, and then the second aspect is transit ridership. If we are investing hundreds of millions of dollars into our vast BRT network, we want people to use it. We want to encourage them to use it. And when they move into apartments or houses or whatever type of domiciles they choose and those that are built, we want them to know that this is a viable option and that they don't need a car to get around. And, and I very much appreciate Councilmember Balcom's point, and we talked about the northern end of 355 yesterday, uh, and I'll reiterate for, for my colleagues, I believe it was a sentiment of the, whole, the T and E committee, that we, we need more transit options in Up County. Um, until we have them, I, I suspect this is not a viable option. And even if we implement this there and in other parts, there's still going to be parking for cars. And let's not, uh, uh, let, let's not delude ourselves here. This does not eliminate parking. It just allows parking to be built with a little fewer parking spots. And if you move into any of those areas and you have a car, you're going to want a parking spot. And if that developer did not build enough parking spaces, I presume you're not going to move into their building. And so that's the metric, uh, the matrix in which they're going to be operating under. But we do know that people are moving into our community without cars. They don't want to have to have a car. And so uh, I would, for purposes of this conversation, um, support the original language that was in the, the ZTA. But uh, Mr. President, when, when you walked out, I asked if we can invite Dr. Director Conklin. BRT. Uh, well, yes, yeah, on this part, not, okay. not on the other aspects. Yeah, that'd be fine. Director Conklin, let's focus on well, the BRT well, yeah, yeah, element. Yeah. We'll yep. bring up the other items later, but feel free to ask Great. any questions you have. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Director Conklin. So can you talk with us just about what how BRT is defined and uh, as it relates to uh, Council Member Mink's proposal, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness of that proposal as well, What is wh what are our current projects and those in the CIP, how would they classi be classified? I'd be happy to share that information with you. We have one operating service on US 29. That service has approximately 30 to 40 percent dedicated lane by bus on shoulder north of Tech Road. Um, our other projects that are in the pipeline are an expansion of that project to increase the amount of dedicated lane. I think it's roughly a 20 to 30 percent increase in the amount of dedicated lane that would be from Sli Sligo Creek Parkway north to the Tech Road area. Um, so that project, if that second phase were implemented, would have more dedicated lane. The Veers Mill project that has been advanced to nearly final design is again in its current incarnation around a 30 to 40 percent dedicated lane project where those dedicated lanes are in locations where the right-of-way is available and where some of the most significant congestion is occurring. Again, on that project, beyond the designed project that's in the CIP, we're looking to increase the amount of dedicated lane by repurposing of lanes in areas beyond the specific limits of the capital project. So today it's 30-ish, 40% range. It may be more uh, in the long term when that project is developed. The 355 project that is also in the design phase, uh, a significant portion of that is in dedicated lane. The south component between Bethesda and Montgomery, and, Mon and actually not all of Montgomery County, 
um, um, Brockville Town Center is nearly all dedicated lane. From there, we're in a single dedicated lane for a portion up towards Gaithersburg, and then we're in a no dedicated lane element north of that. But again, like the other projects, what we're designing is new infrastructure. We're hoping to supplement by repurposing lanes in the future that wouldn't be a capital project of the same magnitude. Our goal is to have as much dedicated lane in these projects as we can achieve within the financial bounds and the real estate bounds that are available. So if you look at the other projects that are in the planning phases now, we have the North Bethesda transitway phase uh, project, and we are looking at some options that repurpose existing lanes, options that build new lanes, options that don't have dedicated lanes. And we're in the same phase for the New Hampshire Avenue BRT that's in development now. As you also mentioned, there are some other projects we have ongoing that are implementing dedicated lanes, but not necessarily identified as BRT. The first of those that's nearly complete is New Hampshire as um, University Boulevard between Four Corners and Wheaton. That will have dedicated lanes, but will not have a unified BRT, and I'll explain the definitional elements of that in a minute. The other project that's also in construction is the Great Seneca Transit Network, which will have, again, significant dedicated lanes and more BRT elements, but not all the way to what we have been identified as the flash system. So the BRT system has a number of consistent characteristics. It will have a similar vehicle type, similar logo and branding and paint scheme, similar all-door boarding, similar station designs, and, and stop only at those stations, and stop at those stations at all times, much like a rail network. It will have an expedited uh, fare payment system. It will have consistent passenger information. It will have a consistent type of bike accommodation on the vehicles and it will have a headway-based operation, meaning that instead of looking at a bus schedule to figure out do I need to be there at 9, 9.30, or 10, the service should be frequently enough that you can say, I'm ready to go, I'm going to go to the station, I know I won't have to wait too long for a bus. Those are the main elements, and then the dedicated lanes are really to give the bus an additional advantage over general traffic on those corridors, and I, as I mentioned, we're looking to do that to the maximum extent we can within the constraints we have. So um, the GSTN project has many of those elements. It will not necessarily have the flash stations. Um, it will not have the same bike accommodation, so it's lacking a few of the elements, but it's close to a BRT. The University Boulevard project, which is a very extensive dedicated lane, will not have any of those other uh, BRT defining characteristics. It will be dedicated lanes to advance all of the bus service on that corridor without a particular bus rapid transit service operating in that location. Great. Thank you very much, Director Conklin. And uh, colleagues, we'll, we'll have another recap of all of that when we take up the T&E uh, CIP at full council. But um, last point, Director Conklin, uh, and I know we just talked about it yesterday, uh, approximately what is the six-year budget allocation for, but for the BRT, not Great Seneca or anything, but for the identified BRT in the CIP? I happen to have the packet in front of me because yes. I brought the wrong packet for today's <laughs> meeting. Um, but overall, it's it's around a billion dollars yeah. of investment planned in the BRT and other transit elements yeah. that support it. So, so we are uh, investing, should the T&E proposal be approved by full council, uh, nearly a billion dollars over the next six years for people to take fast, reliant transit throughout the county. And that investment should mean something. We should want there to be uh, housing, more affordable housing, and more transit options for people all across that network. And I think the original uh, language as introduced, which is in the packet as option A, best does that and best supports our budgetary decisions. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilman Maluki. Thank you, Mr. President. So I want to circle back to uh, Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez's um, proposed amendment because it is simple. It follows the Planning Board's recommendation, which I agree with and does not get us into hair splitting over the definition of bus rapid transit or potentially conflicting with federal law. And it gets us out of, um, you know, some of the other issues where, I mean, I appreciate Councilmember Balcom's comments because my district's very similarly situated to hers. Um, I have no transit ways. Um, I have one metro station. I, I'm very proud of my metro station. Um, 
but I think that option B gives us the most simplistic way to view this. And um, because transit way does have a very specific use, it is limited. It's not any place that there's a ride on bus stop because again, I have a, I have a ride on bus stop that's in the middle of a field on a road with no shoulder. Um, and I don't know why it's there. Um, but I think that option B gives us the, the greatest clarity and path forward. So I wanted to express my support for that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just, uh, so can, before we uh, uh, turn it over to other colleagues, there is a diff, I mean, I, the way that was introduced is not split hairs. It just says BRT as we identify it in the CIP. I mean, that is a very simple definition of it, which we define, which uh, is reflective of what was intended by the, the uh, zoning text amendment as introduced. Um, can you explain, because it's uh, option B, which is the planning board recommendation, which is supported by Councilmember Fani Gonzalez and uh, Councilmember Lukey. Can you explain what that includes and any difference that would be for what was introduced? Sure. So. According to the map that was provided by planning, non-rail transit ways would include 355, 29, and Veers Mill. So it would include what is considered our current BRT, according to DOT. Um, one thing I should flag here, and I should have flagged this in the beginning, based on the list of uses, some projects are going to go to planning, and others are going to go to DPS, and then DPS is going to rely on DOT. So we need a definition that both DOT and planning will be able to interpret consistently. Yeah, just to clarify though, the non-rail transit ways, right. is there a non-rail transit way that isn't bus rapid transit or is everything identified as non-rail transit way in the, uh, under the, the planning board recommendation? Is that the same as, as you have been describing and as Director Conklin has been describing bus rapid transit? Are there any differences between those two from a um, substantive standpoint? So the difference I would note on the map is those GSTN ride-on extras, which planning did include in their map of what they have labeled non-rail transit ways. So that would be the main difference between looking at on a map-to-map -map comparison. Director Conklin, do you want to? Yeah, speak thank to that? you. I, this is a question of the type of service that's provided and the level of service that's provided, which we talked a little bit about earlier about the number of connections being an important element. So the. the I'm not the expert in non-rail transit ways, but my understanding is that it incorporates things like corridor connectors and other facilities that have been identified as primary transit corridors but may not be implemented as BRT. So our advice to council staff was that the BRT definition as applied in the council's decisions on projects was the simplest way to manage this because when you're identifying something as the council is BRT, it's in anticipation of a certain service level and a certain set of service characteristics that may or may not be present in these other facilities. And I suppose we could do something to improve a network like GSTN and then identify it by the council as a BRT and then the zoning provision would apply. Yeah. But short of that, I don't think it's worth getting into whether or not the service level meets BRT or not. I think yeah. if it's so, been identified and defined as BRT, that's probably the simplest. Path. So two points I think are very important. One, this is like a square and a rectangle, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. And it is true that all of the BR, all of the BRT, as we have described, would be included in the planning board recommendation. But it expands what would be included under the zoning text amendment as introduced. And the reason why, when we originally put this forward, we tried to be very thoughtful of ensuring that we were getting the highest quality type of bus rapid transit that we would expect and this would be true full service bus rapid transit that that was a very intentional decision i understand some would like to see parking minimums eliminated everywhere countywide we didn't do that we focus on transit served areas uh, it, you know i understand that you know there are differences of, of opinion on certain things but legislating is compromising and that was the reason why we put it in and, and moved it forward the way that we did. So I just want to clarify, this is not like a clerical, let's come up with language that is easy to identify. This expands the scope of what would be included in the zoning text amendment. If that's what the body wishes to do, 
by all means, we should do that. But I just think it's important the way that it's been described is this was a you know clerical improvement that allows us to describe it in a different way that's easier to interpret. It, it's more than that, it's substantially more more than that, uh, potentially. And so I just you know wanted to to, to note that because I think it's important for the purposes of discussion. Let me turn it to Council Vice President Stewart. Thank you. Um, so I think on this conversation, um, thank you, Director Conklin. I'm leaning towards option A, um, the original language. I do want to acknowledge, though, um, some things that have been said in, in this discussion. Um, I, I fully support this, the direction we're going in, and appreciate my colleagues for bringing this forward. Not everyone has a choice of where they live. and. Director Conklin, you have been, you and your staff have been very helpful because there are places in my district right now where they are predominantly homes for folks who have lower incomes and they are facing huge um, parking issues mm -hmm. because they are not near transit or transit that takes them to their jobs or schools. Um, and so I just, I want to acknowledge that because I think as we're talking about these issues, I fully agree this is the direction we should go for the future of our county. But I also think we have to acknowledge the housing issues that we face and that not everybody always has a choice of simply moving or deciding where to live. And that there are places in our community, and again, I just want to thank the Department of Transportation and others for helping us try and figure out and have creative solutions um, for our community. So I just need to say that. Thank you. Thank you for raising that point. It's always a, a balance as we try to do public policy. That is why some of the uh, approaches that we have taken, some of the compromises that were undertaken were uh, arrived at, but I think elevating that point is important. So I appreciate you doing that. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I do believe we're making this more confusing than it needs to be. Um, uh, I was 4A when I sat down. I am 4A as I sit here. I, and, and I think it, candidly, and I appreciate the simplicity of, of B, but I think A is as simple as B on, on this. I do believe, though, we need to move on for this topic. And, and I appreciate the square and rectangles uh, discussion. I thought I'm, I'm always like a, a, a square and a circle, but anyhow. Um, I, I think it, I, I'm in favor of A and, and would like to actually move on and have a vote. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me turn it over to Councilmember Mink and then uh, Councilmember Jawanda, who is now virtual, uh, will uh, weigh in as well. I actually, you know what? I'm ready to vote for A also. So. Okay. Ready to vote for A. Agree to agree. And the courage and conviction to agree with our original, you know. Exactly. All right. Let me turn it over to uh, Council Member Jawando then, and hopefully we can uh, bring this uh, in for a landing. Yeah. Into a transit railway station? No, no. Um, uh, so, uh, can, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. The question I had is just about A, and, and uh, you know, obviously we had, I was, uh, Council staff mentioned the 111. I was the abstaining one because we were trying to get some additional information uh, and you know so I, and I'm glad we're having this discussion I think there's a lot of important points that were made uh, I brought the point up that you brought up Councilmember Balcom about it really not being in the six year um, and being pushed out I do think the construction language is a is a, is a very uh, good faith and, and a good attempt to try to address that but I still understand your concern the, the reason I was coming into this meeting probably leaning towards the 50% uh, is for two reasons. One, it means that the BRT is actually going and it's, you know, it's going to be a dedicated lane and it will be fast at least for half of the route. Uh, it'll actually be rapid, which is again the R and BRT. And two, it, it also makes it much more likely that it's, it's being built, right? And to address that concern. Um, and, uh, you know, I, so I guess my question, if, 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 if people want to go with the original to council staff and if, if they're best situated to answer is, could you just restate what the original would cover uh, as far as where, so it's just a planned BRT route that has a dedicated lane. So whether or not it's built or not, if it's planned to have a dedicated lane, that would count in that building 
could commence, assuming that construction money had been programmed in the CIP. Uh, is that correct? And if I'm wrong in any thing that I stated, please correct me. Since you asked Council's have, I'll let you uh, go, Mr. Do, but then I may chime in after. Sure. So the way it's written is within quarter mile of an existing bus rapid transit station or a bus rapid transit station that's been funded for construction in the six year CIP at the time of application. So if a developer was to apply funded to, for construction, funded for construction is in the original language and the original language does not mention dedicated. So it would just be if it says BRT in the CIP, any station along that route is in. Yeah, and I'll just if I could just note on that. And, and you heard from uh, Director Conklin as well that the department thinks that this is the simplest way to address it. We identify what is BRT and there are reasons for that. There are funding. Uh, dynamics with the federal and the state government of what you know must be met in order to uh, be considered uh, BRT and frankly it's a pretty high threshold uh, for being uh, BRT the, the challenge on the dedicated lanes and I originally put that forward as a potential compromise uh, the issue is at the 50 percent threshold we would be cutting out nearly everything if not everything at this point we'd be cutting out literally everything so you might as well you know basically do nothing and uh, the second piece of it is it's, it's it's some many aspects of this are sometimes counterintuitive and dedicated lanes actually are one of those examples if you were to say for instance one of the things that's been suggested is well why don't you do it only in the areas that are in dedicated lanes well 355 brt is a good example the most urban heist area is not dedicated lanes because of the land characteristics because you know both the literal physical limitations and the cost of eminent domain or some other uh you know and, and disruption uh that would be caused and so in the in the most urban areas where parking is least needed and necessary you would not have it so uh, you know, just just to clarify, the, the dedicated okay. lanes are not included in that. We do have a definition of B, BRT, bus rapid transit, is included in the CIP. It's not like we just do, we say transit or bus, and then it's up to interpretation what is considered bus rapid transit. We include in the capital improvements program what we define as BRT, and those definitions are subject to federal and state funding requirements and other characteristics as you heard from director uh, conklin earlier yeah I, no i appreciate that and and i i was going to make a similar point to the one you made that it's not it isn't upon hearing the conversation it's not the best marker for even though we do want dedicated lanes right i mean the council's been clear on that it's not the best marker for where you want housing necessarily as far as infield development based on what's on the ground i still think the concern about it actually being built is, is valid, and we hear that from constituents all the time. Uh, Councilmember Stewart's point is very uh, resonates as well that some places you just have to drive, um, and we are doing a lot in this ZTA outside of this point anyway with Metro and you know the other things. So I don't want to diminish the other provisions that you know, uh, but this obviously would expand it more. So so I think given all that, I'm, I, I'll go along with the consensus of uh, uh, with A's that and just now that I'm. 100% clear on what the definition is, which does not include dedicated, but will it will need to be a BRT uh, route in station in station that's funded in the six-year CIP for construction. So I'm I'm okay with that. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna thank you. I'm gonna turn it to Councilmember Ming to make a motion on this. All right, I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve Amendment Option A for this particular amendment. Seconded by Council Vice President Stewart, moved uh, by Council Member Mink for option A, which is as introduced. The committee did not right. formally move that, and so just to clarify, even though it's in the underlying bill, it's not part of formally the committee recommendations, so we're uh, taking this up as part of our uh, procedures. All in favor of option A, please indicate by raising your hand. Yes. That is unanimous. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good discussion, and I'm glad we came to consensus. Appreciate the uh, robust conversation. Let me turn it back to you, Ms. Nadu, if uh, there are other items that you'd like to help us go through. Okay, for our next item, the committee talked about this briefly, but I want to add some additional information, and then I believe there's a proposed amendment. So the way that 
accessible parking and EV spaces work is under ADA. If you provide parking, it triggers how much access, how many access, accessible spaces you must provide. Similarly, in our zoning ordinance, you provide 100 spaces, one must be EV capable. So under this ZTA, there's a chance that a project that does zero parking will not have any accessible or EV spaces. And so Councilmember Albernaz has an amendment. Um, if you'd like to run through it, I can also explain it if you'd like. Let me turn it over to Councilmember Albernaz and he can turn to you to fill in where he leaves off if he yeah, so chooses. I need to phone a friend on this one for sure. But um, I want to um, <clears throat> first really acknowledge the really great work of the committee and of the sponsors who were really thoughtful in thinking through all of the perspective angles here. And I think the conversation that we just had is an illustration of the thoughtful approach that this body has taken to what we know is a very consequential policy that's going to impact a lot of people. And it's in that spirit that I am uh, uh, introducing the following amendment, acknowledging that it's not perfect, that it needs discussion, and it needs to be rounded out because I haven't completely pulled the thread on this, candidly. Um, this, this came about um, for two reasons. One, I actually read an article in the New York Times just a few weeks ago that was really enlightening for me. Um, and it laid out, I think, pretty well just why our country is not hitting the benchmarks that it's established, which were very aggressive and the Biden administration has touted uh, to ensure that we electrify the majority of our vehicles by a certain set date. And the reason why we are falling further and further behind is because we just don't have the infrastructure. Um, and I hadn't focused on the fact that parking spaces are an incredibly important element to that infrastructure, um, not just for the individual cars themselves, um, but for the docking stations. And what's happening now is the majority of people that are purchasing electric vehicles live in suburbs uh, and, you know, therefore disproportionately uh, becoming available to people who are in a better position and have the means from which to afford them. Um, and so, you know, the, the last thing we want to do, I think, is, you know, solve one problem but potentially create another. And so this was an attempt to address that issue. Um, the second issue is, is something I've been focusing on more broadly for a longer period of time. And um, this and previous councils have been incredibly supportive of our disability community. Um, and while um, it's true that, you know, the residents that purchase a property knowing that there aren't parking spaces available and may have a disability can make that choice themselves, but the visitors and family members who may visit other members within that building would not have that option. And so uh, my concern is, is more, it, it's for the residents for sure, but even more so uh, for the potential visitors uh, to these properties. and. You know, as we've heard repeated testimony for uh, the Commission for People with Disabilities, um, the parking issue is a very significant one. And what we are seeing now, because there are fewer and fewer parking spaces, more and more people are actually parking in handicapped parking for short periods of time to run in and out of stores. Uh, and it's having a huge uh, impact, obviously, on that community. So for that reason and with that context, um, I've attempted, um, and really, Ms. Nadu, thank you once again, more heavy lifting, uh, to introduce an amendment that addresses both of those issues. Would you like to add to that and explain to colleagues Section 623I8B, among other items? I'll turn to you, Ms. Nadu. Other than my dream of renumbering the zoning ordinance. Okay, mm -hmm. so <laughs> the way that this will work is you have your apartment building with 100, let's say you have 100 dwelling units and so you have to provide 100 parking spaces. Under the ZTA, that number would go to zero if you are near these transit options. The way the ZTA will work is even though we're saying you don't have to do 100 spaces, you're still gonna go to the parking table and see what your minimum would have been. So in this case, let's pretend the minimum would have been 100 spaces. Under ADA, you provide one accessible space for every 25 you're providing. So if you, had, if you were supposed to provide 100, you need four accessible spaces. So the way the amendment will work is you're not going to do the other 96, but you're still going to have to do those four accessible spaces. 
And then similarly, for the EV spaces, it's one for every 100. So you'd have one EV space and four accessible spaces. So basically, you follow the accessible and EV rules as if you were doing the minimum. Appreciate that. So I'll just, uh, before turning to colleagues, uh, appreciate uh, the manner in which this was uh, put forward. I, I would personally suggest that we separate these two issues because they are very different issues. Okay. Uh, I am very sympathetic to the handicap space issue, and I do think that we should look at that and address that. I will say the electronic vehicle dynamic goes in the opposite direction of what the zoning text amendment is intending, even though they're both ostensibly to address climate, the goal here is to make housing less expensive. Adding an EV charging parking space is the most expensive type of spot that you could have. So um, the most environmentally sustainable parking isn't electronic vehicle parking, it's no parking. It's someone not using a car. Electric car is better than a gas combustion car, but it's not nearly as environmentally sustainable uh, as uh, you know, as somebody who doesn't use a car, and to force somebody to have an electric vehicle and pay for the cost of charging the electric vehicle or, or a portion of the cost of charging the electric vehicle, I don't, I don't think we should do. Having said that, there are needs for electric vehicle charging. I think that's a public infrastructure question. I don't think that should be borne by housing. I think that should be borne by uh, by us uh, in our public policy making, but. I, I think it would be helpful if, uh, if, if we can, as part of the discussion, to separate the, the two items, because even though it was presented in the same amendment, they're, they're two different issues. I'd be fine with that, Mr. President, and um, we can work with Ms. Nadu on the fly. She's quick on her feet. We know that for mm -hmm. sure, um, to, to separate them. Okay, sounds good. Well, we'll take general comments, and then we can, if we want to go into depth on uh, individual the individual items, we can separate them one by one. Ms. Nadu? Sorry, I have one quick point, um, because this question was asked um, about how it would work in PLDs. Um, I know we're going to discuss that later, but um, because in a parking lot district you can reduce your parking, it's possible if you read this amendment in conjunction with the language that lets planning board reduce your parking in a PLD, that you could still end up with zero. Um, but they'd have to be going through the procedures to make the payment that maybe exists. <laughs> um, so just want to flag that in PLDs, you might not actually get exactly four. Yeah, essentially there's currently a mechanism in which you can effectively buy your way out of having to do the parking requirement through alternative means. Uh, so just, just to plain language that a little bit. Uh, Council Member Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and, and the PLDs is a, a Different issue entirely, notwithstanding here in this ZTA, it is something that we at the t and &E Committee and Economic Development Committee have talked about and will continue talking about until we figure, figure out how to update our, our PLDs and, and revenue systems there. But to, to this amendment, appreciate uh, Councilmember Albernaz, um, you know, his continued leadership within, within this space. I agree with the Council President that they are two separate issues. Um, you know, as an uh, owner of an EV myself, my own aspiration is to give up the vehicle and to move into, you know, uh, at some point in time, uh, an apartment and be reliant on walking and public transportation. And so uh, they, I, I do think they are inherently at odds with the intention of, of the, the ZTA. With regard to the handicapped accessible spots, I, I think um, Ms. Nadu uh, uh, kind of teed up my question. Uh, with regard to buildings in central business districts. And the one example that I'm aware of is the Bonifant, which is a 100% senior building in downtown Silver Spring that has zero parking. Uh, and it was designed that way uh, as adjacent to the Silver Spring Library, adjacent to the future Purple Line, two blocks from the Silver Spring Metro Station. Um, and one of the ways to make it deeply affordable was uh, by eliminating the need to build parking spaces to the tune of seventy to one hundred thousand dollars a piece, and so so Ms. Nadu, uh, what what does this amendment do? Would it prohibit something like that from happening in the future on a spot by spot basis? The PLD issue, notwithstanding, yes. Okay. Um, My 
my rationale for introducing this ZTA was with an understanding that it is not going to, to resolve uh, all of the uh, car ownership, parking, and transportation issues. It will make a difference for those who choose not to have a car and are willing to move into a new housing facility uh, where they don't have to have a car and don't have to pay uh, a monthly fee or buy a parking spot. But eyes wide open that there are still going to be, probably every project will have some monicum of parking because we're not quite there in Montgomery County where one can live all along uh, these future BRT stations uh, without having a car. Um, even when my husband and I were living in downtown Silver Spring, our building did not have a parking space. Uh, it was a retrofitted office building on, on Eastern Avenue, uh, but we had one car for the two of us. Uh, and it wasn't until I ran for council at large that I needed to get a car for myself. Uh, and so people call it car light when you have a two or three person household in, in one car. Uh, and so I say that because there will still be accommodations, um, but I have concerns that it undercuts the purpose of the, of the zoning text amendment uh, where we can't accommodate some, some flexibility. So I'm, I'm torn right now. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to suggest, as I mentioned before, that we separate the two items. Um, I think we could start with the handicap parking. Um, my own personal suggestion would be that we move away from the parking table. I think it's very confusing, and I think that uh, it continues to move us where we are as opposed to where we are striving to go. Um, so if we were to, to move forward, my suggestion would be to do the raw numbers, to say, you know, for every... Uh, for, for every, what, 25 spaces you would have to, you would be required, uh, for every 25 units, excuse me, you'd be pro required to provide one handicapped space. I do think that we should provide a waiver, allow the planning uh, board, planning department to be able to waive if you can demonstrate alternative means. For instance, the Bonifant is a perfect example. There's a parking garage right there. And so if there is you're building it next to a public parking garage that has adequate handicapped spaces, then allowing for uh, that flexibility, I think, uh, you know, would, would make sense. But, but maintaining the baseline with uh, the ability to uh, provide a, a waiver, that would be my friendly uh, suggestion to the sponsor if that's something that we uh, were going to, to go down. But with that, let me yield uh, to uh, Councilmember Albernot. I totally agree with that, um, and I was going to say that the Bonifant is built like literally right next to a, a, a garage that has lots of handicapped spaces, and so they address that issue there, but it's a relevant point. Um, the other point that I didn't make before was, you know, somebody purchases one of these units or rents one of these units and then becomes handicapped, um, you know, that's another scenario that's very possible, you know, that, that we haven't fully considered as well. I did have a question, though, for Mr. Conklin, since you're here and you're our subject matter expert generally in this area. Um, I believe this is a federal requirement, um, you know, to have handicapped parking. And so, so uh, there must be, you know, some process by which, you know, if the Bonifant was moved, that there was a waiver or, um, and just your general take specifically on the handicap component. Um, I'm not sure it's a federal requirement to have handicapped accessible parking for every building because as you've heard from council staff, that requirement is based on the parking provision. So if, if you're formulating a project and you have a project with 100 parking spaces, then you're required to provide the necessary percentage of those as handicapped, but otherwise it's, you're it, not. It's set so. up as a set aside. Got it. So yeah. the, the trigger is you are providing parking. Mm -hmm. Once you provide parking, you must set aside a certain proportion of those to be handicap accessible. If there are, if there is no parking, there would be no requirement. The federal trigger is on the parking that you're requiring. That that's them allowing us to set parking here. That's why that's an element. Putting in our our a, a set number just for handicap parking, we'd be going above and beyond what is federally required. Right. But ensure that we're keeping in spirit with having mm -hmm. accessibility with the ability on a case-by-case -case basis to provide a waiver if there are alternative measures. Yes. To push on that a bit more, that is a problem in some cases when the parking provision doesn't match the population of the building. 
um, and you don't have enough or there's no on-street parking in the area and you can't serve the building effectively for disabled per people. But then as the council president mentioned, the idea of a waiver may also be important because this is a requirement that's not otherwise in place for development. So there may be circumstances where a project has no ground, is an overbuild, mm -hmm. uh, where you wouldn't want to mandate that that overbuild provide accessible spaces as part of the project because there's no access to the ground from that project. So there are circumstances where it may not be possible to have any parking, in which case you'd want to be able to have a waiver possibility from such a requirement. That's helpful. And, you know, it's just I'll just say this, you know, that I, I agree in principle with, you know, the market should drive where we go. Unfortunately, the market too often overlooks this community. Um, and so that's why I think it's important for us to, within reason, um, establish this and, and uplift this. Um, and so I'd be open to some kind of a waiver. I, I don't know what that would look like, um, but I think that does make sense and is reasonable. Okay, uh, let me turn it to Councilmember Juwando virtually. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, and I was originally going to second Gabe's motion. I know he hasn't really officially made it yet, but the Councilmember Robin has, but assuming you do, uh, I, I am in favor, now, especially now that we've separated the issues. Uh, agree that we should move towards, uh, and I'd be fine with Council President's suggestion of a number. Uh, if it is, you know, I, I don't know where the 20, if the 25 came from what we were trying to do, then, you know, 25 units per one uh, spot that was, that was uh, accessible. I would be in a favor of that, but whatever the actual calculation was, I think it's really important to call that out. Um, and, and to the points that have been made, uh, people that need those spots now, but also that could need them in the future. Uh, one of the things about having a rapidly aging population is that just, it's going to be true that people are going to move more into that direction and for other reasons as well. So um, I think we should absolutely require it how we get there. I know the amendment was recommending the minimum to have been met so that it does trigger the handicap is how I read it, but how, how uh, are accessible spots. But Ms. Nadu, uh, is that 25 to 1 the ratio that we were trying to achieve? I guess would be my question. So I use the 100 to 1 because the table has a lot of fractions. <laughs> so that was just an example. The exact number of spaces required per dwelling unit is like 1.25, 1.25, 1 1.5. So that was just an example number. Um, the 25 is from the ADA has a table. Um, and basically, up until 150 for every 25, you provide one space. And then when you get into the bigger numbers, it actually, I think once you hit like 150 to 200 now it's every 50 spaces you provide one so it scales on the okay. higher end um but that's where the number 25 came from all right so it's based for people who know about this and percentage of population it's it's based it's a rational basis for it so yeah so i'd be open to that also open to a waiver though i will say um i i, I think there's a lot of reasons people could become in need of an accessible spot that so oh, I, I i would be you know, a little leery about a waiver that would allow you to not have any at any point. So depending, and unless you're, unless the reasons are that you're next to a, a place like the Monofont where you have a ton of spots. Um, so uh, I don't know, I, but I'd be happy to leave that to regulation, but just wanted to say that. Yeah, well, the, the, we could define the waiver. The waiver could, it's not based on undue burden, which is a financial standard. It could be based on accessibility. parking. Yeah, you know, accessibility of alternative ways to meet the standard which would be next to right. a parking garage would be an example of that got it yep okay so, thank that, you just as a suggestion you know so the bonafont for instance you know which has done that by the way that also would not have this zoning text amendment be more stringent than the current standards where the bonafont was able to move forward without parking requirements because the the restriction was waived under certain circumstances so you know, I think it's important that we, you know, at the very least, we should be doing no harm here. Uh, but you know, the goal, you know, to address is is a legitimate, uh, is a legitimate one. Um, okay, let me turn it to Council Vice President Stewart, and then I can turn it back to Councilmember Albernaz if he wants to yeah. make a motion based on the conversation and see where the support is. 
I'm, I'm good with where we're going and like this conversation, but I will get lit up if I don't speak to the Bonafont <laughs> because it is not working perfectly for everyone who lives there. And I just want to say that. I'm not saying I disagree with the direction we're going in, but again, have had many conversations with Director Conklin about folks who do live in the Bonifant have struggles um, with parking. Um, we are working on and looking at how we can do better to serve people who um, live in the Bonifant and other places to make sure that they can access the parking that is near them. But right now, it doesn't work perfectly for everyone. Um, that doesn't mean I disagree with the direction we're going, and I will fully support this, but um, I will get lit up by my constituents at the bottom line if I just did not say that today. Thank you. The do no harm category uh, of do no harm as a council member and representative of a community. So no problem, and appreciate you raising that. Council Member Albernaz. Thank you. Um, Mr. Do, this is the phone a friend part. Um, could you try to articulate um, the amendment that separated and considers the waiver or some other term that gets to the heart of what Council President Friedson recommended. Ooh, okay. Ward smithing on the fly. Here we go. Um, so if you go to B, you'd say residential uses under 623 IA8 must provide one accessible parking space for every 25 dwelling units, period. The planning board may waive this requirement based on, and this is where we need language on what that standard is. Um, in my time working with planning, I think they'd appreciate clarity on what the council intends is a good reason for a waiver, whether that's a list of examples or if you know if it is just because you're next to a building with accessible parking. Either way, I think a little more working through what that would be. Um, luckily, we're not voting until next week, so I can also meet with planning in the meantime. So I'm going to make a suggestion. Yes. I think we should take a straw vote on the concept here. Uh, if, if colleagues are comfortable, just to give specific direction to staff and to planning to move forward, but then we can approve the final language next week when we come back. Mm -hmm. Uncomfortable. Council, Council Member Katz? Thank you very much, Ms. President. So what happens if it's 26 units? You round down. You. So, wait, sorry, let me answer that better. So if it's 26 <laughs> units, you would still only provide one. So, and so there's no, if, if you don't get to the 50, you only have to provide one? Yes. You, uh, to me, that's a problem. That's the current standard. I, I understand, but if we're changing something here, and to me that that is a problem. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in favor of the concept here, but I think that could lead itself, lend itself to a problem. If you have, if you have 40 units, you know, you still only have one. Thank you. I think we should dig more into that for sure, but, but I think what I'm, I'm ready to move the general concept of, as Ms. Dedu noted, um, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag what she's okay. All right. there's I'll, I'll a, second. I'll there, second right. what she there's said. There's a Michael Scott. Yeah, there's a Michael Scott reference here somewhere that someone is looking for. So uh, the the concept here has been moved by Councilmember mm -hmm. Albernaz, seconded by Councilmember Lukey. We'll take a straw vote uh, to give direction to colleagues all in favor of moving forward with a number one uh, for 25 for handicap parking requirement with a waiver that is specific. Uh, to planning to allow them to waive it in certain circumstances when alternative means can uh, address the issue, please raise your hand or indicate by saying aye. Yes. All right, that's unanimous. We'll come back with specific language if that could be distributed to us beforehand and ideally included in the packet if possible by Thursday. That would be even more ideal, but uh, as long as it's distributed to us uh, beforehand, that would be helpful. Okay, so we've disposed of that. Do we want to continue discussing the electronic, uh, the electric vehicle? I'll withdraw case? that. I, I okay. think I've, I've read the room. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So I appreciate the, the rationale. I do think there are, like with PLDs, 
Parking lot districts, there are lots of conversations that we need to be having about electri uh, electric vehicle recharging, electric vehicle batteries, electric bus batteries, uh, and electric infrastructure in Come general. Come to the T&E committee anytime you want. And <laughs> the uh, Transportation and Environment Committee chair has welcomed all from far and wide, uh, hopefully uh, via reliable accessible transit uh, to, to join for the conversation or virtually, which it's always available. Uh, let me turn it back to you, Ms. Nadeau. I think that's mostly it for me other than a quick note. So the committee did discuss a lot of other amendments. So mark stations, increasing the distance, incentive density points, and whether tracking should be done by planning and DOT in terms of what projects we're getting. All of that's in the staff report or the county executive memo if there's any questions about any of that. Um, but otherwise, those were all amendments that the committee had recommended or discussed. And so all that's left is the PLD issue if the council wanted to discuss that. The oh. bond issue, sorry. So, so the, the bond council issue. Yeah. Okay, so unless there are any other items, any other amendments that colleagues want to move forward, I will turn it over to Director Conklin who can explain the concern, explain how the executive branch is moving forward, albeit extremely late, and uh, the timing of that and whether or not that will be completed by next week when we will take a final vote on this measure. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I apologize on the executive branch's behalf for the lateness of the information that came to you today. It was reflected in our comment letter uh, that we provided last week, but there hadn't been enough attention between the agencies to get you more specific guidance, which we were able to do overnight and going into today. Um, the concern is largely around the financial model of the parking lot districts, which up until 2016 had relied on a combination of fees, fines, and ad valorem tax revenue. In the 2016 time frame, that ad valorem tax was set to zero, but was not eliminated, and you've had plenty of discussion about that, as that was a means people could have attained the goal of this in the parking lot districts before you take action on this motion. But the the, the concern has been that there have been bonds issued in the Bethesda parking lot district. Uh, there, ha there have also been ideas to have bonds in other districts at different times. So the parking lot district bonds are independent from the county's general obligation bonds. Um, we understand, although we don't know the extent sitting here today, and this is the, the reason we need a bond council opinion, we understand that the presence of the ad valorem tax as a tool, even though it was set at zero, had a, an impact on the rating of the parking lot district bonds. It is essentially giving them a higher quality than relying solely upon parking fees and fines as the sole revenue source. We don't know the extent to which that was relied upon in the bond issuances that have occurred and the extent to which that might result in a lower quality rating for future PLD bonds. So I I'm, I'm don't know the answer, so that's why we suggested to you that we need a bond council opinion. Um, in terms of the implications of that, if it did have an impact, there may be the need to take faster action on a restructuring of that ad valorem tax so that it is available as a policy tool should the fees and fines prove to be insufficient to meet the bond requirements. So I do apologize for the lateness of highlighting the s uh, significance of that issue. It came to our light after the last council work session on this and some internal discussion and the baton didn't get handled efficiently enough to the finance department. So Director Covey also extends his apologies for not getting you the information. Is it a timely way as you would have liked? Yeah, I appreciate that. Just two, two points. Uh, one, the Zoning Tax Amendment was introduced on November 28th. So even though it was at a high level raised in a letter that came to us without any specificity or a suggestion that you were gonna move forward with a formal bond council, uh, you know, determination, uh, the request itself, even at a high level, came extraordinarily late after the work session, which has been months in the making. Um, the last minute request following that, it just needs to be better. Honestly, the, the, the coordination among executive departments needs to be much better and the collaboration and communication with the council needs to be better. And I appreciate the mea culpa here, but it this is not the first time this has happened. I imagine it won't be the last time it would happen, and it is not helpful to the public, and it's not helpful to public policymaking, and so it just needs to 
improve. And I will say it begs the question in many instances like this, where whether or not it is a agency department level policy concern and implementation question, or whether or not there are concerns by the executive and the political leadership and whether or not that is you know, part of the last minute nature of, of some of these dynamics. So I will, I, I will leave it at that. I appreciate that on the, on the PLDs themselves, as the Transportation Environment Chair noted before, and I'm sure we'll note here momentarily, parking lot districts are predicated on parking revenue to support parking infrastructure. We have financial challenges in parking lot districts that are oftentimes directly in contradiction to our public policy goals where we're trying to drive down non-auto driver mode share, where we have uh, you know, uh, TMDs and other uh, efforts where we're, where we're desperately trying to reduce the reliance on cars that are relied upon to create the revenue needed to support the infrastructure. So uh, on those issues, if we held up every decision that we made on our broader public policy when it comes to housing and environmental sustainability concerns specifically and climate concerns specifically, we could get caught up in save the parking lot districts scenario forever. And we would never move forward with our broader environmental sustainability goals and in addressing our, our housing challenges too. So I, I understand it's a legitimate question. I will say here as the person who is putting this forward uh, and, and, and setting the agenda, we are voting next week. So your discussions internally and with bond council need to happen prior to next week's meeting and well before less than an hour before the meeting. So do you have an indication that that is going to happen? Uh, I'll relay that to Director Covey, who needs to be the one coordinating the bond council opinion, but we understand the timeline you're looking to work on. Just to be clear, the executive has not taken a position on this ETA. Um, however, the issue that we have discussed with him is the potential um, parking lot district financing. Control. Yeah, the understandable concern is whether or not the county executive takes positions without taking a position by delaying and throwing wrenches in the policy making process the last possible minute. I will take it at, at your word that that was not the intention, but you can understand uh, that the question uh, within the, the public uh, has been uh, raised uh, here as it has been raised uh, at times in the past. Let me turn it over to uh, the chair of the t &E committee. Thank you. So if there's a silver lining to this conversation and the timing of it, it is that we are once again um, letting the entire council know of the problems with the PLD. And it is something that I have expressed uh, every budget cycle uh, at the Transportation and Environment Committee. And it is, uh, it is tricky. And what makes it even trickier is when we have uh, a system that was created decades ago that is no longer uh, supporting the land use policies and transportation policies that we're trying to foster throughout the county and foster with this ZTA. Uh, and so that's why I, uh, I, I express severe reservations with the delay, but more importantly, what comes out of the conversations with the bonding authority. Because even if the rating agency uh, expresses concern with this ZTA, that is a huge problem because we are trying to promote good public policy that will then be stymied by an outside rating agency. I don't think that will happen. But if it does, that's the bigger existential problem we're facing. We'll find out in the next week or so. Um, uh, and then lastly, I, I, I know uh, Director Conklin, you, you just said the county executive hasn't taken a position. Uh, I appreciate the council president saying, you know, this is a CTA uh, that is wholly within the council, uh, council's prerogative. But I will note, uh, as, as a, a frequent listener to the Kojo Namdi show, when this was introduced and he was asked about it, the county executive did say he was supportive 
um, ellipses and said he didn't think it would do much. But he is on the record on the Kojo show saying he does support the ZTA. Longtime fan, sometimes listener. Touche on that. Um, so it appears that maybe it does something because there's enough concern to hold it up for a week. I yeah, uh, appreciate I, that I don't being think noted. the concern is with the ZTA itself. It's with the ZTA's implication on the basis of the Advoarum tax. So that's the issue we have to run to the ground, yeah. which is the bigger existential Yeah, I totally understand. I, I would just, I will end this portion where I started and echo the uh, chair's points here. We cannot be held hostage by the fiscal challenges of the parking lot districts to do the public policy that we need to do to advance the county in the way that we understand and recognize it needs to be advanced. And there are implications to decisions that we make, and we have to deal with those implications. But it's just that. We need to move forward with the public policy that we have, understand fully the consequences that are going to come, and address those fiscal realities. The parking lot districts are challenged in many ways and have to be subsidized in order to address them at times. And you know, we understand that there are uh, implications uh, as a result. I will you know, echo my colleague here. My decision on this is not going to change based on the uh, response uh, by uh, the Bond Council, but I think for the interest of the body and for everybody to feel comfortable moving forward, having the response uh, in an appropriate time frame within a week uh, is uh, understandable uh, at this point to, to uh, ensure that everybody is comfortable moving forward. Uh, with that, we are going to take. Um, we're going to hold. We'll take a straw vote on this. We're going to take a straw vote uh, on this uh, to indicate uh, support as amended, uh, and then we'll ultimately take a, a, a roll call vote with the finalized, formalized language uh, next week of the zoning text amendment. So, uh, with that, we'll we don't need a motion for a straw vote. So, indicate. Uh, Support by straw vote. That is all those present. Uh, Ten to nothing. I don't hear council member. I, no, I, I support it. I, oh. I just hesitated because I, you know, but yes, I, the pending information, I support. Okay, we'll, we'll mark that as a yes on the straw vote. Um, and uh, that is uh, 11 nothing on the straw vote. And we will move forward with a final roll call vote next week. We'll look out for. Uh, information from our uh, zoning attorney and from the executive branch. Okay. All right, we're going to move on now to item six, slightly behind <laughs> schedule for consideration action on supplemental appropriation 2450 to the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County government, non departmental account, payment to municipalities, Gaithersburg and Rockville, patrol officer costs, and the amount of $1,076,000 uh, $1, source of funds is general fund undesignated reserves. A joint public safety and government operations and fiscal policy committee work session was held on February 15th. Chair Stewart, would you please share the Joint Committee's recommendation? Sure. The Joint Committee's recommend approval of the more than $1 million supplemental appropriation for patrol officer costs in the cities of Gaithersburg and Rockville. For background, on November 1st, 2023, um, the police Montgomery County Police Department implemented a staffing change that impacted the two cities' police departments. Since then, Montgomery County Police Department has shifted full and primary responsibility for police calls for service to the respective city police departments. The supplemental funding is needed due to cost increases for required payments to the cities. Currently, um, Rockville and Gaithersburg Police Departments assume full and primary response duties for calls for service within their respective municipality limits. The Montgomery County Police Department will continue to assist both municipalities on priority calls for service and provide backup assistance to ensure that public and officer safety is not jeopardized. Um, during the discussions, we also talked about the need to revisit tax duplication um, as the reimbursement for police services is part of the tax duplication formula. And I'm looking to, forward to working with Mayor Ashton of Rockville as she is the president of the Maryland Municipal League. So it's a favorable recommendation to council. Thank you. Uh, we have a favorable recommendation. Uh, also note, speaking of uh, communication, uh, there was also a significant discussion during the committee of better communication by the executive branch with our municipal 
partners. This came as the result of a very abrupt uh, decision that had major operational impacts, and uh, we would like to have better communication and collaboration. Mm -hmm. Our municipal partners uh, would as well. Uh, and uh, the other thing that was uh, noted, uh, we identified the uh, mayor's ash twins. Yes. Uh, yes. Which uh, was a new... <laughs> New terminology, but we thank them for their uh, participation both in the public hearing uh, and in the uh, joint committee uh, work session and for their partnership as municipal leaders and as our hosts uh, for our place of work and business. Uh, so we have a joint committee recommendation before us. All those uh, in favor, please raise your hand. Yes. That is unanimous among all those present and one virtual. Uh, nobody is opposed. We'll move on to the next item on our agenda. This is action on special appropriation 2422 to the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Health and Human Services, opioid abatement funds. The amount is $3,088,862. Source of funds is the opioid abatement funds. An amendment to the FY24 operating budget uh, 2184 Section G FY24 designation of entities for non competitive contract award status identity Inc. for $280,000. A joint uh, government operations, fiscal policy, and health and human services committee met on February 7th to discuss this appropriation and recommended approval. Uh, however, I did want to note that on February 21st, the county executive transmitted a formal request to remove the Section G amendment to the FY24 operating budget resolution 2184 as a different and timelier process for making these funds available was identified, which will allow Identity Inc. to begin providing services immediately. So I will turn it over to Chair Stewart to please share the recommendation from the Joint Committee regarding Special Appropriation 2422, and then we'll see if there's a motion to re amend this by removing the Section, G, uh, uh, the Section G award as requested and suggested by the County Executive. With that, let me turn it to Chair and Vice President Stewart. Thank you. So our joint uh, government operations and our health and human service committees uh, met and we were joined by council member Natalie Fanny Gonzalez and I just appreciate her advocacy in this area. We do recommend approval of the more than $3 million for the special appropriations for the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services opioid abatement funds. This appropriation will support strategic initiatives focused on substance abuse disorder, peer support and treatment for use with substance use disorder. The funding will also sustain ongoing efforts around the development and widespread dissemination of a community awareness campaign. Personnel services include five new county positions dedicated to prevention, harm reduction services, and evidence-based practices proven to reduce overdoses in the county. Just a short background on the funding. In 2023, the state announced they received funding in the legal settlement with opioid manufacturers, distributors, and pharmacies. The state indicated that Montgomery County would receive an initial $5 million, and this special appropriation represents the initial allocations as uh, of these funds. The committee did discuss the ongoing costs of this program and how it would be funded. HHS staff reminded that Montgomery, reminded Montgomery County is a participant in the settlement and that the latest estimates project that the county will receive approximately $43.3 million over 18-year distribution period, so concerns by joint committees regarding the ongoing costs were um, addressed. Um, as the uh, Council President said the Section G piece has been changed, so uh, we need. I'm happy to move the motion uh, to approve the amended resolution. Thank you. That motion has been moved. It is seconded by the by uh, Councilmember Fonny Gonzalez uh, with with an assist from uh, with an assist a friendly assist from Councilmember Katz and his uh, graciousness. Uh, so we have a motion uh, on the floor. Uh, let me turn it to council member sales uh, thank you mr president i just wanted to um refer to the memo that i sent over to the county executive uh, regarding this allocation to increase um, additional funds for the upcoming fy25 operating budget in the amount of half a million dollars i believe i shared that with uh, my colleagues as well um, we've seen a 300 percent increase in juvenile violent crimes um, with regards to arrests. Um, the number of young violent crimes um, 
Uh, the victims have grown by more than 200 percent, uh, with numbers upwards of 679. Um, and so, uh, with were we going to uh, increase the amount or? Uh, I. Your memo was a suggestion for mm -hmm. next Good fiscal time. year's budget. I wasn't aware that there was a request to increase. If you're looking to make a motion, that uh, wasn't discussed during committee, but the floor is yeah. open. You'd have to, uh, there's, a, there's a motion before, I can clarify that what the motion is, uh, but you'd have to move a, a different motion. Okay. I did bring this up during the committee meeting the joint committee session i can only speak for myself i can turn it to the chair my understanding was there was a reference to a memo that was sent talking prospectively about the uh, next fiscal year's budget and a request by the county executive to add funding uh, to his budget this is a supplemental appropriation to the current fiscal year based on the current program to get the program up and running the committee's recommendation didn't include and doesn't include next year's uh, operating budget but if you have another motion that you're looking to move forward the floor is open and you can make a motion to amend the amendment but we well is this too is this pr too premature to request consensus around an increase for funds towards juvenile crime prevention well, I think there's generally support for adding funding for mm -hmm. uh, for these purposes I th if the question is whether or not it's an appropriate time now where we're taking up a special appropriation for FY 24 to discuss and make decisions on FY 25's operating budget that would not be the appropriate time now okay I yield thank you okay great thank you for raising that let me uh, let me just turn it back. The uh, the motion we just need two motions. We need to move to remove the section G amendment. Yeah, I moved that. Yeah, yeah, so we're good. I did that. Yeah. And, you, yeah. Yeah. and then seconded. So we're going to take that up first. I just wanted to clarify you that was yeah. what was intended. So uh, there's a motion on the floor to remove the section G amendment. All in favor, indicate by saying aye or raising your hand. That is unanimous yes. Uh, yes. by those uh, present and one virtual. Uh, is there a, a, a motion to approve as amended? I would like to uh, move a motion to approve as amended. That is moved uh, by uh, Chair and Vice President Stewart. That's seconded by Councilmember Albernaz. All in favor of the amended motion for the opioid abatement funds and uh, operating budget. Uh, 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 supplemental appropriation. Please indicate by raising yes. your hands or saying aye. That is unanimous by those present and one virtual. And with that, we are approved as amended. Our next item on the agenda is item eight, special appropriation 2445 to the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Health and Human Services, Youth Safety Initiative Contractor in the amount of $96,000 from General Fund Undesignated Reserves, an amendment to the FY24 operating budget, Resolution 2184, Section G, FY24 designation of entities for non-competitive contract award status to Umana Public Health Solutions, LLC. Chair Stewart, would you please share the Joint Government Operations Fiscal Policy Committee recommendation? The recommendation was unanimously um, to approve uh, this resolution and move it forward to the full council, this appropriation will support the youth safety initiative by allocating funds to a contractor to help facilitate the coordination of a comprehensive public-private um, health public health response. The CAO is uh, recommending an amendment to Section G of the resolution um, to add a new contract with Umana Public Health Solutions. Um, the contract funding is needed to address the increase in youth victimization and participation in crime. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a committee recommendation before us. All those in favor of approving Special Appropriation 2445 and the Section G award as recommended by the Joint Committee, please raise your hand or yes. say yes and that is unanimous by those present and one virtual 
our final item on today's uh, agenda before we get to the consent calendar. Uh, I need a motion to waive Rule 70 of the Rules of Procedure to allow for immediate action on item A. Normally, I would be doing this as the District 1 Council Member, but since I can't make motions from the floor uh, presiding over the meeting, I would ask colleagues, but this is for a resolution acknowledging the February 12th, 2024 election returns from Friendship Heights Village Council. As some of you may be aware, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Friendship Heights Village Council needed to hold uh, in additional uh, election due to the deeply unfortunate passing of one of their council members. We express our deepest sympathies and, uh, and uh, send our uh, wishes to the family and to the community. Uh, they did uh, hold a, uh, a, a, an election and we, uh, as part of our standard practice, have to uh, approve and uh, acknowledge uh, that action. So do we have a motion to waive Rule 7D? So moved. Second. Moved by Councilmember Lukey, seconded by Councilmember Sales. All those in favor of waiving Rule 7D? Aye. That is unanimous, 10 and 1 virtual. And then now is there a, mo a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll note that this is on the consent calendar, the, uh, the motion to suspend the rules to take action uh, had to be done before the consent calendar, before we take a motion on that. Uh, just uh, very quickly, I did um, want to note that we uh, have an item on the uh, consent calendar that's very important to me, that uh, and very important to the members of the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee that I just wanted to uh, uplift the introduction of the uh, first tranche of the uh, what will ultimately be the $50 million nonprofit preservation fund. Uh, this is nearly $20 million. The goal is to have it up to the $50 million as, uh, as uh, intended uh, by uh, the beginning of the fiscal year, next uh, fiscal year. Uh, and uh, as colleagues know, we put in a project for this with virtually no funding uh, in order to facilitate this process so that once uh, a uh, disbursement was made back uh, to the county uh, from a right of first refusal that we could uh, begin the process of funding this. We had a robust discussion in our committee uh, yesterday. I won't reiterate that, but the goal of addressing the preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing and partnering with our nonprofits, which was always the second piece of the $100 million housing production fund uh, with HOC. That's what this uh, special appropriation uh, will uh, begin to accomplish and really want to express appreciation to the executive branch, to HOC, uh, and to our nonprofit uh, housing partners for uh, their work and efforts uh, on that. So with that, I will open it up to uh, a motion. I'm going to dutifully make the motion, but I just wanted to highlight something sure. else yes. on the because I love it because I asked for it. Um, so I want to thank our Office of Legislative Oversight for a uh, report item listed at item H on the consent calendar planning, design, and supervision um, of our CIP projects in county government. This year, like other years, we're faced with a gap in our CIP and a lot of more tough decisions to be making about projects that are residents need, deserve, and that in some cases have already been delayed and delayed repeatedly. Um, so this gives us the opportunity to take a look at things that affect overall budgeting um, in our CIP budget due to delays um, in delaying our capital projects. So I wanted to find a way to have a, a a document that would allow us to help quantify the cost of these types of delays in the overall grand scheme of our CIP decisions. So um, thank you to Natalia and Blaze from OLO, and I look forward to discussing this in more detail on March 21st at the GO Committee session. And with that, I move to approve the consent calendar. Thank you. The motion has been made to uh, move the consent calendar, which I will note goes from A to Z. I think that's yeah. the first time I've seen item Z on a consent uh, calendar, which just displays the level of consensus that this body uh, has. We have a motion for the consent calendar. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Katz. Uh, all those in favor of approving A through Z, the consent calendar, please indicate by raising your hand. Aye. And saying aye. That's 10 in person, one virtual. The consent calendar has been approved.
Uh, we have completed uh, the items on our agenda. This council will return at 7 p.m. for a public hearing for Bill 224, police traffic stops, consent search of motor vehicle and data collection. Uh, we are now in recess until 7 p.m. We will see you here then. Thank you, and we are adjourned. The traffic pattern at Crab 